லமரந்தை கல்லொழுகும் சீராழும் பதனமென திகழ்பழதா கந்தமெதில் தெக்கணமும் அதிசிறந்த திராவிதனல் திருநாளும் தக்க சிறு பிழை நுதலும் தழைத்தனரும் திலகுமே அத்திழகா வாசனை போல் அனைத்துலகும் இன்பமுற எத்து செய்யும் புகழ் மணக்க இழிந்த பெறும் தமிழனங்கே தமிழனங்கே உன் சீய இளமை திறம் இயந்து செய்ய மழந்து வாழ்த்துதுமே 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 எல்லாருக்கும் வணக்கம் இந்த இனிய பொங்கல் திருநாளில் ஒரு அறிவு சார்ந்த முன்னெடுப்பில் இன்னைக்கு வந்து நம்ம எல்லாரும் இணைஞ்சிருக்கோம் எல்லாரும் தமிழ் சங்கத்தில் இருந்து தமிழ் சங்க மெம்பர்ஸ் எல்லாருக்கும் கரும்பு கொண்டு வந்து கொடுத்துருந்தோம் எல்லாருக்கும் கிடைச்சிருக்கோம்னு நினைக்கிறேன் இனிமையான இந்த பொங்கல் திருநாளில் நம்ம ஒரு விர்ச்சுவலாக இந்த பொங்கல் கொண்டாட வேண்டிய சூழ்நிலை வந்தபோது ஒரு முன்னெடுப்பு எடுத்தோம் பொங்கலில் ஹெரிட்டேஜ் நம்மளோட தமிழர்களின் தொன்மையை வெளிக்கொள்ளுங்கிறதுக்காக இந்த முன்னெடுப்பு ஸோ இதில் வந்து இன்னைக்கு மிக சிறந்த இரண்டு ஆளுமைகள் இந்த கடைந்த கடந்த பத்து வருடத்தில் நம்ம தமிழர்கள் கிடைத்த பெரிய வரப்பிரசாதம் சொல்லலாம் மிஸ்டர் டோனி ஜோசப் தமிழர்கள் மட்டும் இல்லை இந்தியன்ஸ்க்கே ஸோ டோனி ஜோசப் ஐயா அவர்கள் அவர்களின் ஏர்லி இந்தியன்ஸ் புக் வெளியே வந்து ரொம்ப சிறப்பாக கிட்டத்தட்ட நாற்பதாயிரம் பிரதிகள் க்கு மேலே எல்லாரும் வாங்கியிருக்காங்க பல அவார்ட்ஸை கொடுத்து குறி வாங்கி குவித்திருக்கு அதுக்கு மெயின் காரணம் என்னென்னு பார்த்தீங்கன்னா அதில் இருக்கிற அறிவு சார்ந்த கருத்துக்கள் அவர் வந்து நடுநிலைமையாக இப்போ இரண்டு பேருக்குமே ஒரு பெரிய பலம் இந்த இடத்துல பார்த்தீங்கன்னா இன்னொருத்தர் வந்து பாலகிருஷ்ண ஐயா அவரும் நம்மளோட இணைய இருக்கிறாங்க அவர் வந்து ஆர்கியாலஜிக்கல் சைட் ஆஃப் லாஸ்ட் ஃபைவ் தௌசண்ட் இயர்ஸில் என்ன நடந்திருக்கு அப்படிங்கிறத பார்க்குற பார்க்குறோம் ஆனால் இன்னொரு பக்கம் பார்த்தீங்கன்னா அதுக்கும் தாண்டி பத்தாயிரம் வருடமா முன்னாடி என்ன நடந்திருக்கும் இருபதாயிரம் வருஷத்துக்கு முன்னாடி என்ன நடந்திருக்குங்கிறது நம்ம ஜெனடிக்ஸ் தான் சொல்ல முடியும் அந்த ரிசர்ச் எல்லா பப்ளிகேஷனும் சேர்த்து டோனி ஜோசப் ஐயா வந்து ஏர்லி இந்தியன்ஸ் யார் அப்படிங்கிற ஒரு இது வந்து அந்த புக்கை வந்து வெளியிட்டிருக்காரு அதன் முக்கியத்துவமாக இன்னைக்கு வந்து முதல்ல டோனி ஜோசப் ஐயாவை வந்து வருக வருக என்று வரவேற்கிறோம் அவர் பிஸ்னஸ் வேர்ல்டு ஒரு எடிட்டராக இருந்து ஆனால் பின்னாடி வந்து நமக்காக நம்மளோட ஹிஸ்டாரிக்கல் ஒரு ரிலவன்ஸை வந்து இன்னைக்கு பேச போகிறாரு ஸோ வி வெல்கம் டோனி ஜோசப் சார் ஃப்ரம் அண்ட் ஹீஸ் ஜாயின் அஸ் ஃப்ரம் சிட்னி தேங்க்யூ சார் தேங்க்யூ ஃபார் அக்செப்டிங் அவர் இன்வைட் ஃபார் திஸ் ஸ்பெஷல் டிஸ்கோர்ஸ் அண்ட் அண்ட் த டேலஸ் தமிழ் கம்யூனிட்டி இஸ் வெரி ஹாப்பி டு ஹியர் ஃப்ரம் யூ சார் தேங்க்ஸ் ஃபார் ஜாயினிங் thank you very much mr selvan uh, i look forward to the today's event and uh, continuing my uh, involvement with your uh, with your events kalai vanakkam to all in india and malai vanakkam to all in the united states it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you and i thank uh, tamil sangam for inviting me uh, to this pongal celebration It's also a pleasure to be here with Mr. Balakrishnan IAS with whom I share a deep interest in in Indian prehistory. Uh I have about 20 25 minutes with me and the title as you already know is the antiquity of the Tamils. I think the title translates into the question uh how far long back can we take the ancestry of the Tamils or the Tamil speaking people? uh in the indian subcontinent and uh, since tamil is a significant part of the larger dravidian language family the question then becomes how far long back can we take the history of the dravidian languages in the indian subcontinent as you may already know even though the harappan script has never been deciphered it was always the majority opinion in academic circles that the harappans the people who built the harappan civilization 
uh, which was at its peak around 4,500 years ago or so, uh, spoke uh, a proto-Dravidian language. And uh, Dr. Idavadam Mahadevan, who revealed to us the secrets of the Tamil Brahmi inscriptions all over South India, was also the person who uh, shaped much of our understanding about the presence of Dravidian languages in the Harappan civilization. But the fact that the script was never deciphered uh, left this uh, an inconclusive observation. Uh, Dr. Mahadevan is no longer with us, but I think what is surprising is that in the last few years, remarkable new discoveries have put more flesh and blood on the idea that the Harappan civilization, that in the Harappan civilization area, uh, proto davidian languages were spoken. And this is what, uh, and how much these new discoveries have added to our understanding of languages and language spread in India, uh, it would be the topic of the rest of my talk. The, uh, these new discoveries are uh, thanks mainly to a relatively new discipline called population genetics. And what has happened in the last few years is that population genetics took a deep, a, 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 a giant uh, leap uh, in terms of what it was able to do. It geneticists acquired the ability to extract DNA from people who lived tens of thousands of years ago and analyze them. Uh, and what it, this made a huge difference because until then, uh, population geneticists could uh, look at the DNA of currently living people and then say that this population group is related to this other population group or population Z is related to population Y more than population A is to population B. But they could not figure out how these relationships came about. Did some people in population A move to population B or did some people in population B move to a population A for this relationship to come about? And this is what uh, the ability to extract ancient DNA and analyze it, this is the problem that it solved. I will get, explain it shortly before going on to its consequences. Let's say that there is an archeological site in Chennai. And from that site, from a level that is 3000 years ago, uh, we extract DNA, analyze it, and see that there is no vestation ancestry at that level. But let's say that from the same side, from a level that is 2,000 years ago, we again, we extract DNA from another skeleton, old skeleton, and then we see that there is actually presence of vestation ancestry. Then we come to the straight conclusion that between these two periods, 3,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago, there, uh, a new ancestry came into this, into this place. Now, what has happened is that over the last few years, Hundreds and hundreds of ancient DNA samples have been recovered and analyzed from all over the world. And that has given us a far sharper, clearer understanding of human population movements in the, in the last tens of thousands of years. And that has given us much greater understanding of how different populations formed all over the world, in Europe, in the Americas, in East Asia. And so the new discoveries and understandings that we are talking about are not specific to South Asia. It is part of the overall uh, better understanding of human prehistory. Now, as you can imagine, uh, when you understand how populations moved, you get a far greater understanding of how languages moved and spread. Uh, because today you can listen to, uh, you know, various uh, courses on, on 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 our mobiles or otherwise learn new languages, but in ancient times. Languages moved when people moved. So today, when you say that you have far greater understanding into how people moved in ancient times, what that means is that we also have a relatively far better understanding of how languages moved. Now, the rest of, the, uh, of this talk will be divided into three sections. At first, we'll look at what this new understanding based on uh, population genetics and population formations, how, how it gives, gives us a better understanding of how the global population formed all across the world. Second, then we will look at how the Indian population formed in the context of the 
uh, of how the world population formed. And the third part will look at if this is how the Indian population formed, what does that tell us uh, about ourselves and about our languages? Now, the first part, the how the world population formed. What we now know is that uh, we can say that all of the world's or most of the world's population was formed because of four classes of migrations, not four migrations, but four classes of migrations. And what are these migrations? The first class of migration is the out of Africa migrations, which you might have heard about. This is the uh, migration of, uh, of a subsection of the African population into the Arabian Peninsula around 70,000 years ago, 70, 70,000 years ago, who then, they might have numbered more than, no more than a few hundred people, and who then expanded, spread out all over the world, populating the rest of the world. And the last continent that they peopled was the Americas, and that is around 16,000 years ago or a little more. So between 70,000 years ago and about 16,000 years ago, this small group of a subsect of the Afri uh, uh, African population moved out and peopled the whole of the world. How do we know this? Because if we today analyze the DNA of all of the people outside of the African subcontinent, we will find that they are descendants of a small subsect of the African population that existed about 70,000 years ago. To put it in other words, the, the genetic diversity in Africa is so much more, so much more than the genetic diversity in the populations outside of Africa because the humans have been there for far, such a far longer time. So this is what you call the uh, first class of migrations, uh, the out of Africa migrations which uh, people the world at different points of time. Now, as these modern human population groups were spreading around the world, a major event happened. And that's the, that's the glacial age, which, which lasted from about 29,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago, 17,000 years ago, a whole, that's a, that's a very long period. During glacial periods, what happened is that the world's water gets locked up in ice, which means that there is very little evaporation and the world becomes dry, arid, forests become deserts, and uh, naturally people get uh, uh, you know, separated from each other because large parts are uninhabitable. And this is the period when uh, some the different population groups began developing along slightly different lines, accumulating some minor genetic differences. It's important to bear in mind that the modern human population still today share 99.9% .9 of their DNA so the differences that we are talking about are marginal in the larger scheme of things. So the next big thing happens after the glacial period ends. What we see are population groups in different parts of the world experimenting with agriculture. Not all of them are successful, but a few population groups are very lucky because they happen to be in regions where there are wild varieties of uh, cereals, rice, wheat, barley, which they can domesticate. And domesticating these kinds of uh, cereals are extremely productive. So much so that these hunter-gatherers could then take to farm, set, uh, settled life as farmers. And this happened in four e regions initially, Egypt, Mesopotamia, India, and China. And where in these regions where agriculture took off and hunter-gatherers became farmers, settled farmers, the next consequence of that was a huge population explosion in these regions, leading to migrations. So this is the second class of migrations, agriculture related, that changed the demography in almost all parts of the world at different times. And uh, as you can imagine, settled farmers, their population grows at a much faster rate than that of the hunter-gatherers, and they expand and they marginalize, and because they grow at a much faster rate, the hunter-gatherers in each of those regions. So this is the second class of migrations, which can be called agriculture-related migrations, driven by uh, man's mastery uh, over nature. And uh, this is, as you can see, this is something that happened over centuries and sometimes millennia. And we are not talking about small, short periods of migration. We're talking about migrationary forces that lasted centuries. And uh, the third class of migrations happened when a small population, modern human population group in Central Asia, steppe, grasslands, mastered the art of metallurgy, wheels, wagons, and ultimately horses. 
Kudurai uh, and how to ride them and create chariots. And uh, with they, modern humans finally acquired the kind of mobility that they never had. And the result of this was huge population movement from Central Asia uh, into Europe, all the way up to the last end, up to the way of uh, the westernmost part, which is the Iceland. Uh, these migrations changed the shape, changed the population of Central Asia itself, West Asia, South Asia, all the way up to China. So this is the third class of migrations, uh, which happened. This could be Central Asia, again call them Central Asian migrations uh, that changed the demography of a very large region of Eurasia. The last class of migration, the fourth class, uh, it, we know about them much more, which is the colonial migrations, because a small group of humans in Europe figured out how to travel large distances over the seas and dominate uh, regions they get to. So these changed the populations, demographics of, uh, of the Americas, of Australia and many other parts of the world. But as, as we know, this did not affect the Indian population much because the number of migrants who came as part of colonial migrations in India was far too small compared to the existing population of India to leave a genetic mark. They might have had a, a cultural impact, but in terms of the genetic impact on the Indian population, this can be ignored. So that takes us then to the Indian population formation. Now, if you are, you are then saying there are three classes of migrations that shaped Indian population. First of all, the out of Africa migrations, which happened 70,000 years ago. When did they reach India? We now know that they must have reached India around 65,000 years ago, because we know that they reached um, we know that they reached uh, East Asia by around 50, 50, 50, you know, by around 59,000 years ago, uh, uh, and they reached. Um, uh, so, looking at the the way that they spread across the land, we can fairly arrive at a figure when the first Indians arrived in uh, India. That's about 65,000 years ago. So, we have the answer to the question: When did India get peopled? Around 65,000 years ago, and where we can can we find them? The answer to that is also now clear. If you say you want to find the first Indians uh, who have not mixed that much, you, you probably have to go to uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which population, they are, they are also mixed, but they are mixed less with other uh, uh, population groups uh, than the rest of the uh, uh, populations in India. But the fact is, the ancestry of the first Indians forms the base of the demography uh, of the ancestry of all Indians. So in my book, I talk about this as the base of the demographic pizza. So without this base of the first Indian ancestry, there is no pizza, there is no uh, demography. So no matter what language you speak, which part of the, uh, of the subcontinent you are, uh, what religion you are, what, where in the caste hierarchy you stand, you all carry the significant ancestry of the first Indians. Now comes the, as we said, the second class of migrations that change demography are agriculture related. So what about that? What, what, how, how did that shape Indian demography? The first evidence for agriculture in India comes from a place called Mehargarh in the Balochistan province of what is today Pakistan. And that evidence goes back to 7,000 BCE. That's 9,000 years ago. That's when you can see the first evidence of agriculture starting up. Uh, and uh, and then spreading all across northwestern India over the following thousands of years. That's a huge population expansion and explosion as agriculture spreads throughout the northwestern India, ultimately resulting in the Harappan civilization uh, in it, within its mature form existed between 2600 BCE and 1900 BCE. So who were these people who drove the agricultural uh, expansion in northwestern India and built the Harappan civilization, the largest civilization of its time, as large as the Egypt and Mesopotamian civilizations put together. So who are these people? Genetics has the answer. The genetics says that it's a the population, it's a population uh, of, uh, it's a mixture between first Indians and a population related to the early farmers of Iran. In the, sense that the pop, in the sense that the population that mixed with the first Indians and the early farmers of Iran descended from the same population group. We also know that the, this population group that mixed with the first Indians, they are closely related to the populations that were there 
in the Zagros mountain region of uh, Iran, specifically uh, a place called Ganjdare, which was the first site of goat domestication in the world. That's from where the ancient DNA were collected. So what we now know is that there is a connection between the people who populated uh, and mixed with the first Indians and created the, Har the agricultural revolution and the Harappan civilization that followed. Uh, and the regions called Zagros mountain region in, 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 in Iran, which later became the site uh, of the Elam, uh, of the kingdom of Elam, uh, who spoke a language called Elamite. Here is where it gets interesting. One of the first, long, long, long before anybody knew that there was something called the Harappan civilization, which was discovered only in 1920. Uh, about 150 years ago, Linguists were already suggesting that there is a link between Dravidian languages and the, Il and the Elamite languages of the Zagros region of Iran. And uh, these were studies that were done, that were suggestions that were made in 1853, 1856, and even later. So what has happened is that the link between the Dravidian languages and the Elamite languages that were suggested by linguists about 150 years ago has now been supported by genetic evidence of links between the people of the Harappan region uh, and uh, the, their common descent with the people of the Zagros region. So this uh, brings uh, a much greater understanding of, uh, of, the, fact, of the fact that uh, the, it's likely that the Harappan civilization spoke a proto-Dravidian language. Now, when did that language come to South India? Uh, they are, the understanding till now has been that uh, the, the Harappan languages, the, if they were proto dravidian moved down to the South India after their civilization declined around 1900 BCE because of a long drought. Uh, I, I suggest that it's possible that this happened a little, quite a bit earlier. In fact, around 2800 BCE even before the mature Harappan civilization began. Why is that? Around 2800 BCE is when you see uh, pastoral uh, life beginning in, south, in southern India and uh, then slowly agricultural, agricultural revolution happening as it happened in northwestern India and spreading all around the country, all around southern India. And as we know, languages spread when the agricultural revolution happens in a region. And if the agricultural revolution, if that happened around 2800 BCE, it requires two things. It requires uh, domesticated plants, which in the case of South India, were uh, millets and pulses domesticated for the first time uh, in South India, and uh, domesticated animals, which we now know from archaeological studies, where came from North India. So it is quite likely that the domesticated animals, the cattle, sheep, goats, were brought to South India by the farmers or the herders of the Harappan region who spoke a Dravidian, proto-Dravidian language. And if you say that that is the mixture that happened, that spread uh, agriculture in southern India, then we can see the, 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 the proto-Dravidian language is spreading across southern Indian peninsula, starting from that region. It's quite likely that, uh, that when the Harappan civilization declined, there was a further influx of people from the Harappan uh, civilization bringing uh, uh, a proto dravidian languages again. So that gives you a, a, a better picture of what could have happened. So now we know that the, the people of the Harappan civilization, they moved when their civilization declined because of the drought that I spoke about. They moved east to northern India and south to southern India. But what happened to their languages in northern India? because when they moved, they took their languages, their culture, uh, and uh, their genetics with them. And they moved all over India. That's why we know uh, it is accurate today to say that the Harappans are the ancestors of all Indians, North Indians, South Indians, East Indians, because they moved all over the world. And you can see, as we will, list, as we will uh, I'm sure we will hear when we listen to uh, Mr. Balakrishnan's talk uh, later, so they spread all over the world, all, all over the subcontinent. But what happened to their languages in northern India? That's where we have to take into account the migration, the third migration, third class of migrations that we talked about, 
which is the migration of the people from Central Asian steppe region who brought Indo-European languages to India. And genetics says that migration happened between 2000 BCE and 1500 BCE, which means that arrival happened after the Harappan civilization started declining. And uh, the new migrants, with their mastery over metallurgy, horses, and uh, their arrival, they dominated northern India. And that caused a language shift from pre aryan uh, Proto-Dravidian, or other languages into Indo-European. And, uh, and we can see the impact of this mingling between the new migrants and the earlier residents in the oldest layer of the Sanskrit language we today, we, we today have access to, which, which is the Rig Vedic Sanskrit. Rig Vedic Sanskrit already has retroflex, what are called retroflex consonants, which are sounds like ta, da, na, uh, which are typically uh, Dravidian sounds or pre-Aryan language sounds in the Indian subcontinent. And these are rarely seen in other Indo-European languages, but they are very much part and parcel of the oldest Sanskrit that we know, which suggests the interaction between the uh, new languages and people who came into the country between 2000, 1500 BCE and the people of uh, North India uh, and the people existing, already living uh, in these regions. An interesting part, a thing to uh, mention is that the Central Asian steppe people, they moved into Europe almost a thousand years earlier than when they came into South India, uh, uh, they came into India, South Asia. The South Asian migration happened between 2000 and 1500 BCE. Their migration to West Europe happened around 3000 BCE. And when they moved into uh, Europe, uh, the language shift was much more dramatic. In Western Europe today, there's only one known Indo-European language that is spoken, and that's called Basque. And that's spoken in a small region of France uh, and Spain by less than a million people, about 900,000 people. In the Dravidian languages in India today are spoken by around 20% of the people. So there's a big difference in the way these migrations impacted language spread in these two very different uh, regions of the world. Uh, so that gives you an idea now of the both the Indo-European languages and their spread, which is spoken by nearly uh, two, uh, you know, seventy percent, more than seventy percent of the people uh, of the country. And there are also two other language families that form part of the Indian language spread: Austroasiatic languages, which came from as a result of the migration starting from China, uh, which came all the way through uh, East Asia and reached India after around 2000 BCE, and which brought Austroasiatic languages such as Khasi and Mundari spoken in uh, a central and eastern parts of the India today. So this it gives you uh, a big picture of the language spread and uh, also the, uh, the way that the population was formed. India is the result of multiple migrations in ancient history. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing surprising about it. All population groups in the world are the result of multiple migrations, as we just listened. That's the way population groups are formed. Uh, today, if you look at the North and uh, Western India, it will carry more of the West Eurasian ancestry. Eastern India would carry more of the East Asian ancestry. South India would carry more of the First Indian ancestry, but we are all mixed. And the Harappan civilization, people of the Harappan civilization spread across all of the uh, subcontinent. But it is important to bear in mind that their linguistic, that their linguistic heritage <coughs> today lies with South India in the form of the Dravidian languages. This is also why in recent times when you see uh, attempts to assign the Harappan civilization to Indo-European languages, uh, that's a divisive attempt because today we know that the Harappan civilization belongs to all of us, all, all Indians. There are, even though their linguistic heritage lies with the South India today because of the Dravidian languages, they spread all over. And uh, it's important to understand uh, this factor that we are all Indians, that we are all migrants, and that we are all mixed, and that we carry the legacy of multiple strands of migrations that uh, came into India in, uh, in prehistory. Uh, 
I think I am with, I hope I'm within my time. Uh, so I hope that was useful and would be glad to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Sure, sure, sir. Very, as the comments came in, it's a very informative uh, talk and uh, it's all from your years of uh, research and reading through so much of uh, genetical uh, information and also cross-referencing all the other aspects. So such a great uh, discourse of all the information of years of accumulation of knowledge. So we'll further uh, continue the discussion, sir. Now, um, the, I think we are at the right juncture, at, uh, like Balakrishnan sir says, um, the genetic things which you prove gives way to the really where the um, Balakrishnan sir's research comes in, right, the time period. And you extensively covered about the language shift. And I think now Balakrishnan sir, we'll invite Balakrishnan sir uh, into the discussion so he can continue the journey as, as uh, he, his book is also called The Journey of Civilization. Welcome Balakrishnan sir. So it's an excellent uh, combination of uh, genetics and archaeology and from not just from um, um, occupational that a researcher standpoint, but standalone risk, independent researcher standpoint, where there is no bias and it's pure research. So welcome, sir. Uh, please uh, continue the discussion so that we can uh, learn more about what we can, um, how, how the, uh, like the topic we say, is the roots and roots, right? So nama vergal engar na vandhichu, and the viludhikala engar elam pochu, avdi ngarada patti inoom sallunga ya. Manakkam, uh, good morning uh, for us, uh, good morning for a good evening for all of you. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenal uh, talk given by uh, my friend uh, Tony Joseph. Uh, it's fact, uh, actually, I really like uh, the whole format, the roots and roots and a poetic touch. And then uh, Tony and myself uh, talking uh, on the same platform and the same subject, though we earlier did not know each other. Uh, both of us are not uh, academician full time. That means we don't work for any universities. I I do something for my profession, and he does. He was doing something different, and we met. In fact, uh, I am thankful he made all the way to uh, Chennai to participate in the release of my book in on December sixteenth, uh, two thousand nineteen. Uh, with this background, uh, let me uh, uh, convey my pungal greetings to all of you. Uh, I, for the sake of uh, some of um, the people who may not follow um, Tamil, that uh, I will try to make it bilingual, but I am also keeping uh, conscious of the fact that uh, Tony is here. I will try to make a more of an English and less of a Tamil. Pungal uh, Valtakal. Pungal Portogrela Vande, we need to keep one thing in mind. This is uh, one of the most, it's a very constructive one. Uh, Pungal does not, uh, Pungal celebrates the labor, uh, Pungal celebrates the agriculture, it celebrates the uh, uh, agro pastoralism, uh, Matu Pungal. It actually it celebrates the inclusiveness. Uh, a lot of uh, men and women are uh, involved, the families are involved, communities are involved. Above all, it does not celebrate anybody's death. That means, Tho Paramasivam used to say, Pungal Pandi Evande, Yend the Pirapinalum, Yend the Yerapinalum, Yend the Titinalum, Tudapada or Pandi in Shulver. Yedna, it's not a Jaini of somebody. Ninganamande, Slatrula Kondadua, a birthday of a particular god or a leader. It's not a death day of an Asura. So that way it's a constructive Akaburu Mana or Trula, and we all assembled here. Now it has become part of the identity of a Tamil, with the including Truvaluva Dinam also. I'm happy to be part of the celebration, number one. Number two, as say the uh, sum total of what uh, Tony said that you scratch every Indian, whether he is living in Madurai or Tinalvali or Bhuvaneshwar or uh, Bengal or in Punjab, you will find uh, some element of uh, Harappan in him in terms of the, he belongs to a particular heritage uh, culturally in a different way genetically. There, there is an element of Harappan. You can't say that a Harappa today belongs to A or B location. Then at the simultaneously, when you deal with the history, history is not only important, it is inescapable also. Varalare Taravagalal Katavike Vendu. 
ஏன்னா அதர்வைஸ் வந்து என்ன ஆகும்னா வரலாறு கட்டுக்கதைகளால் கட்டமைக்கப்படும் ஸோ வரலாறு கட்டுக்கதைகளால் கட்டமைக்கப்படக்கூடாது அப்படிங்கிற அக்கறை நமக்கு இருந்ததுன்னா அந்த வர வரலாறை வந்து நாம் தரவுகளால் கட்டமைக்க வேண்டிய தேவை இருக்கு இஸ் ஆக்சுவலி நோயிங் தி பாஸ்ட் இஸ் டு பேசிக்கலி டு சம் எக்ஸ்டென்ட் கைடு தி ஃபியூச்சர் ஆல்சோ அந்த வகையில தான் வரலாறு பிகம்ஸ் வெரி இம்பார்ட்டன்ட் அப்ப வேர் ஹி வேர் டோலி லெஃப்ட் தட் தெர் இஸ் அ சிவிலைசேஷன் தெர் வாஸ் அ சிவிலைசேஷன் தெர் வாஸ் அ பாஸ்ட் டு இட் and then suddenly that celebration that civilization comes to an end it could be a multiple reason people say climatic reasons and there is a continuous drought and then uh, then those theories of uh, somebody coming and totally defeating them is all become outdated now it's a, it's a basically a kind of a, con- a very multiple reasons a civilization comes to an end i start with the question what happened to that people does it mean that all the people who lived in harappan civilization area harappan civilization area is a, both egyptian and a, 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 in the sumerian civilization geography put together the indus civilization harappan civilization area is more than that or equal to that <coughs> such a big civilization such a big population what would have happened to them where they went and if you have to mark their legacy you try to reconstruct in which linguistic group we can you have run a fair chances of reconstructing this is a question i am dealing with uh, i can i take can i take one minute just i'm just a minute i'll just send a message yeah uh, so so with this one we are looking at the uh, the journey of a civilization my book deals with that so then we look at the people suppose assume it's an assumption the people left whether all the people left the answer is no many people stayed back many people uh, started moving slowly agriculture one example you take it you can take it the recent pandemic the moment the recent pandemic came the people who afforded it i know people who went all the way to russia only to put a vaccine so they said that's a better vaccine i know people who went to dubai put the vaccine and come back that means the affording man i know the people who purchased ventilator at home and kept it i know i know in delhi how, how people purchased ventilator and kept it but the poor people were walking 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 thousands of kilometer so a calamity provides a different type of situation for different people a merchant a rich trader who was already trading with sumeria he knows what is his procurement area what is his source area he was sourcing uh, teak from uh, southern india he was sourcing pearl from southern india he was also sourcing the conch uh, bangle sangu valayal from the gujarat and south india you know who lives what like uh, tony rightly pointed out people should not confuse that uh, whether the tamil people or the dravidian people today in south india started moving towards the south only after the decline of the a uh, harappan civilization most likely the answer is no even they must have started moving before that also they already settled some kind of neolithic life or agriculture life or a simple life in the south india they were also doing some kind of sangu sangu valayal seidal and pearl thing muthu kulithal and other so many things also they must have engaged so then this enterprising harappan uh, traders were in touch with the every every area just to get a, a lapis lazuli they go 1900 kilometers up north to a place called sartugai in the eastern in the africa sorry in the afghanistan and they get that raw material for that raw material they are setting up a, a settlement there if they could travel 1900 kilometer in the difficult area for a raw material why why they will not travel from lothal from gujarat down to uh, karwar and to the uh, musiri patnam and the other areas of south why not rather this is more uh, hospitable area so that way the harappan people were also in touch so it must have provided different type of opportunity some people must have taken uh, sea route some people must have easily moved through the coast the agriculture ma- ma- migration must have taken in phases and uh, and then as he rightly pointed out people moved from all the direction some people reached the eastern india 
if if i am an eastern indian that mean from the orissa and the bihar if i can reconstruct the some elements of the harappan contiguity gear because that is the reason i call the brw uh, block and red wear pottery area so there is a, then how to prove it that mean how to prove that the harappan language cannot be read now what is written no one has read it it is only speculation most likely dravidian asko parpola says airavada mahadevan says many scholars have told is so most likely dravidian but we do not know whether it is written korkai or vanji or tondi or pandian or cheran cholan whether anything written saptan anything written adan written or not we do not know the moment i am going to read that something called adan is written in in harappan uh, in the seal somebody is going to say that uh, no 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 it is not uh, adan it is raman or somebody else somebody may say but i cannot deny him so i have to take uh, another route uh, instead of trying to decipher the, uh, the 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 indus text i went in for some non decipherment route that is i did it for about 30 years i will put it in a background then i will put a small presentation to you we have to have a litmus test like in the uh, in the science in the chemistry we put a litmus test so you have to put a litmus test it will be proved both ways what people must have carried with them when the people travel they carry their language so you travel to now all of you in america both in eastern time and western time you are all living in america and what you carried with you you carried with you the memories of your roots you carried with you your language you carried with you your culture beliefs and faith system your gods and goddesses the murugan has walked with you mariamman has walked with you so all your gods have walked with you and the memories of your places also walked with you <clears throat> when after when the europeans went to of america what they carried with them why 20 london sorry in america now right now there is a 20 londons amsterdam sir there paris is there so many european names it did not went by flying it went because people migrated the europeans went there lot of african names are in america because afro is afro americans they carried there is a place called nile there is a place called little ethiopia so and also considering first thing that they carry their names as an identity they carry their languages and what they leave behind because they also leave behind the names also that means suppose that somebody is having a, a london they did not carry away the entire london to america london was left behind london was carried paris was left behind paris was carried so before getting into it i wanted to prove through a known uh, migration that means it's an american a uh, uh, european american migration known migration like this another i case study i did it that case study of the parsi people there is a community called parsi in india you know that tata the ratan tata he belongs to uh, parsi community and the nariman is a great advocate so he belong to like this lot of people are there and then there are villages associated with the settlement associated with the parsis everybody knows that parsis travel from iran to india i did a case study about them to prove that today important uh, parsi surnames and parsi settlements names are still remaining as a village name place name in iran if the parsis carried uh, their place names to the new location if the europeans carried their place names to the new location why not harappans left their old names and carried their uh, name to a new location this is a litmus test i wanted to put it so then then i wanted to look at the second thing what are the characteristic features of the uh, harappan which is very very unique which make them unique without which you cannot uh, reconstruct this he would not have left so what are that those aspect harappan civilization though it is a very civilized very developed one it has got a strong agricultural base and second thing a strong pastoral base in the sense that agro pastoralism kalnadai valarpu velanmai in the irandilum kedaitha ubari dan in the sindhuveli panbattinudaiya harappa panbattinudaiya nagara nagargeyathirkku vali koli irukkavendum that means that is the basic bedrock of the economy second feature is that urban settlements they come out of starting from megargar they have a very planned city mohenjo dara harappa uh, 
Kalibanga and Dolavira and Lothal and they had an urban settlement concept that means city life. Third thing, they had an expertise in the uh, in the maritime trade. They were trading with the Sumeria, Mesopotamian area. That means they are good in maritime. And fourth is metallurgy. That means the bronze uh, Mohanjodara dancing girl statue, uh, lost wax method, one of the brilliant things. They are good in metallurgy and the art and craft. And they are the little fun-loving people. That means there is no pyramid-like structures in Harappa, like in Egypt. There is no huge temples like in the Sumerian Mesopotamian towns, but there is a public facility. There is a bathing ghat, Kuliparai, and then there is a good drainages. There is an excellent street, and then there is a granary, and there is a little bit dichotomy in the, in the, in the city planning. The west is high, east is low, and then this is a little more populated. That is the public area. It's something like we call it a downtown and, uh, and other area. Na? That suppose you go to the area in where they in the in the Lutian areas in Delhi there are some areas will be government buildings will be there and some area will be the common people will be living this you will find it in every cities which is very properly planned there so that way you find the public buildings in the western side and other buildings in the north in the in the in the eastern side and all are very well regulated and very good drainages uh, garbage bins and everything excellent brilliant uh, life and then mother goddess sourcing so these are the, I can slightly put five points or six points I have to tell, without which you cannot reconstruct Harappan civilization. Now, we have to, we, then suppose if the Harappan people moved into the other parts of India, they created their own new civilization or culture, then that culture must carry the legacy markers of this particular unique aspect. That means a person used to for a foreign trade, he may, his scale may come down, but he still remain his skill of uh, seafaring skill will be there. His tendency will be there. His tendency, like why there are some people are good in merchants, Jews, or how Sindhis are good in uh, doing a trade, how the Sittis and Sittiyars are good in uh, South India, why certain communities, Sahus are good in Eastern India, why some communities are doing, uh, that you can say some group of people good in trading. Some group of people are very much committed to the agriculture. Some people are very good in metal work. So that way, this expertise is kept within the society. So that way, then, then after some time, the literature, if the Harappans could build such a big towns, construct drainages, garbage bins, and granaries, and were they not having, if they could have a sculpture, art, what was that language they spoke where they having a oral literature you cannot reconstruct oral literature you do not have the recording of what we they spoke we are not able to read certainly such a people at some point of time when they reduce their carried forward memory from oral literature to the written literature the legacy markers of their past would be embedded clearly in that literature this is my second uh, third that mean in Indian subcontinent, some culture or some group of people who give importance to all this, which is different from what the uh, latest migrants, what uh, Tony calls the last migrants, if the, some, some other representative literature, what it says, is there any distinctive differences there? So I take two, two candidates very strongly. Though uh, there is a theory about the language X, the ostrich connection of the uh, Indus Valley, two important contenders for the legacy of the, it is, it is not to say something bad about another person. We have to keep it in mind that a Tamil literature, the Sangam literature is one of the most secular and one of the most cosmopolitan. I'm telling you, I'm really surprised. The Yadam Mure, Yavarim Kelir, a kind of thought process. All the places are our place and all are our kith and kin. You go in on any, any direction, there is a food for you. The world is wide. There are a lot of good people to patronage you. This kind of statement will come only from the travel loving, a, a, a community, a society, which has got a huge experience of the people and places. Only such a civilization can make a statement like that. This is my assumption. 
second thing is that uh, any literature that celebrates the urban that celebrate uh, that that uh, that literature that language which can lay claim to harappan must celebrate the cities i am looking at the sangam literature there is a uh, 58 places where the yeah 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 lady a yeah, woman a yeah, girl's beauty face forehead eyes uh, her entire look is compared with the look of a town can you imagine suppose suppose in america you will say that uh, uh, yeah you are looking beautiful like uh, 12th avenue or uh, you 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 are looking your face is like a times square you don't make a, you don't say that uh, you look like pandi bazaar and you look like uh, ori palayam you don't make statement today but in sangam literature இவள் இந்த நகரை போல அழகாக இருக்கிறாள் இவளுடைய நெற்றி இந்த நகரினுடைய தெருவை போல அழகாக இருக்கிறது ஒன்லி இன் அ சொசைட்டி வேர் தி அர்பன் லிவிங் எஸ் காட் டு தி வெயின்ஸ் அண்ட் பிளட்ஸ் தி கலெக்டிவ் தாட் ப்ராசஸ் ஐ கேன் கம் அவுட் வித் சச் அ லிட்ரேச்சர் தி மோஸ்ட் அர்பன் லிட்ரேச்சர் இன் இந்தியன் சப் கான்டினென்ட் தி என்சியன்ட் கிளாசிக்கல் அர்பன் லிட்ரேச்சர் இஸ் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் தி எ லிட்ரேச்சர் ஹூ நோஸ் தி மேரிட் டைம் ட்ரேட் அண்ட் நுவான்சஸ் ஹூ விச் நோஸ் தி சி a literature which does not know the sea cannot lay claim to the harappan that mean most is sea faring most is sea loving most is uh, the literature which knows the nuances of sea maximum is sangam literature and the literature in which the mother goddess is venerated and celebrated is sangam literature in silapadigaram only starts with the pumbugar potrudum a city is worshiped so that way i was looking uh, the kind of a contrasting paradigm Uh, the two climates one is that a uh, vedic sanskrit climate another is a uh, uh, dravidian climate represented by a lot of people now feel uncomfortable about the uh, ver- use of the word uh, tamil and dravidian and i don't have such kind of discomfort for me i look uh, in an academic sense uh, the if if you say that how, how can i say that uh, malayalam is not a dravidian language i am living in orissa how can i say that the kuvi or kuyi language which is exactly like tamil and telugu how can i say uh, it does not belong to my language family so i have to give a tag so throughout the world a tag of dravidian uh, linguistics the linguistic tag is given i am quite comfortable with that so considering that in the in the, in the within the dravidian family the only language which is having a very ancient literature it happened to be tamil there is a, there is no equivalent for the uh, sangam anthology and i can comparable with the, with that kind of approach you can find it marathi pragriti which is exactly like a sangam literature in the in certain aspect written in prakrit but that is the, not the popular way of doing it from there the kalidas takes that particular uh, um, uh, impact of it so having said that i i took the place name study i wanted to um, uh, i wanted to say whether if they left they would have left their place and that name they would have carried it and celebrated so then i i want i looked at the sangam literature which is the most celebrated name i know madurai madurai will come but i didn't want to take a madurai as a test case it must because somebody will say it's a madura puri uh, in in uttar pradesh madura is there madura puri in the literature is there i didn't want to take a kanji i wanted to take a name few names which is not not known to anybody else if i say korkai vanji tondi three important places of chera chola pandya nobody in india will understand probably somebody in kerala will understand nobody will understand nobody will make a claim no korkai is mine vanji is mine if i use the pandya chera chola nobody will make a claim so such a names only i collected it i found that place names in in indus geography now i call it say korkai vanji tondi complex i try to find out uh, and quickly i will run 5 uh, 10 minutes of uh, presentation and uh, so that then i will start explaining i'll just say a small presentation to vetri um, i i have my slide uh, carry on
Just a minute. Just a minute, just a minute. Yeah, it's uploading. Am I audible? Yeah, I'll, can I hear, can you hear me? Petri? Petri, can you give me a feedback? Yes, we can hear you, I think. Okay, I'll quickly run through it. Uh, this is this a case like uh, uh, Tony also told that uh, Jabros Mountains and uh, the uh, uh, Iranian mountainside. Uh, of all the statement, I like the statement of the Kamil Zwalabal. He was a scholar from Czechoslovakia. He said Dravidians were a Highlander folk. He says they are the basically Malay Makkal. That means Kurunji Makkal. That is the reason the most important Dravidian god, the Tamil god is Murugan. That is the reason Malaysian Tamils have gone and created a temple in, uh, in the Kapattu Caves. And right now today, uh, uh, is, uh, Tony is in Sydney. And the Sydney and Melbourne, Australia also, there is a as uh, Murugan temples are there, it's all located in hills, even in Delhi, Malay Mandir. So then these people were li living in a northeastern Iran in 4000 BC. Along the route, various Dravidian speaking tribes peeled off the main stock. The first to come off being the people speaking some of the northwestern Dravidian who might have played an important, even a leading role in ethno-linguistic composition of the Indus Valley civilization. I quote this statement for the first time, a linguist and a scholar, a literature, put it together. That means Indus connection, Dravidian connection, everything put together, Kamil Swadabal made an authentic statement. So now, it's a, I don't want to put that. It's already Tony told, told that. It's the first uh, migration, second migration and all. And uh, the sum and substance of what Tony Joseph books brings out, Vagis Narasimhan study and uh, David Rich and studies and the, the brilliant uh, book of uh, Tony Joseph, it's basically formation of the South Asian polity. It looks from the Harappan ancestral South Indian, North Indian, all put together. Now we are coming, I already told that the place names travel, Parsi names travel to India. Now this is the, you see this particular map. Eh? You, I am reading some of the names from the uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan side of the uh, Indus Valley civilization. Vanji, Tidian, Tidian, Tithan, Tidian is Sangay Lekatlavandu, Talavar will pay over. Malli, eh, Solan, Urai, Urai, Urna, Wakai, Thondri. Thondri is a place in Sangam literature. Eh, like this, it's a, you will see Koli, Vanni. Eh, those who are eh, Sri Lankan Tamils, they can easily relate to that particular Vanni. There is a place called Kallur. The Kallur itself is mentioned in Sangam literature, our ancient place. It talks about the Sang Kallur in a flashback. It talks about the, the Tulpair Kallur. The Kallur, which was famous during ancient time. So, which Kallur? So, I located all the Kallurs in India and created a Kallur corridor up to Sangam literature and the present Tamil Nadu and making a question which Kallur Sangam literature talks about. So, if you read the name, you will be shocked actually. Pungukar and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and Murugan, Korkai, Vanji, Yal, Milai, Milai Kandan, there is a pair, Kanji, Kachi, Amur Mallan, Sangam literature. That means I have taken about something around 300, 400 names without which you cannot create a Tamil identity, Sangam identity. I have located that places in the Indus geography. I can give the latitude and longitude. The beauty is that to these names, nobody else will make a claim. I have made it very clear. I am not using the uh, Mathura or some other name because that somebody make a claim. This is in the unique domain of the uh, Sangam literature. And uh, I'll just put a small example. How we have to do it? Tolga Piyam, 
as a first grammar book is giving a grammar how to call a baby camel how to call a male camel how to call a female camel on watakam pen watakam kulandai watakam adhaavadhu and the kandru idella enna vaarthai solla petta ingra vaarthai payanpaduthirudhu kandru ingra vaarthai payanpaduthirudhu idhu vande irandu mirangalukku adhu and ilakkanathai thulgaapiyam solludhu onnu vande kavari kavari nu solra yaak rendavadhu vande watakam அது வந்து மாற்றரும் சிறப்பின் மரபியல் அப்படின்னு தொல்காப்பியர் சொல்றாரு இதை வந்து எவனும் நினைச்சா மாத்திர முடியாது எவனும் நினைச்சா மாத்திர முடியாதுங்கிற மரபியலுக்கு நான் இலக்கணம் சொல்ல போறேன்னு சொல்லிட்டு அவர் ஒட்டகத்தை பத்தியும் பேசுறாரு ஒட்டகத்துக்கு இலக்கணம் சொல்றாரு கவரிக்கு இலக்கணம் சொன்னாருன்னா தென்னிந்தியா முழுவதும் இந்த ஒட்டகம் இருக்கவே இருக்க இல்ல ஒரு காலத்திலையும் ஒட்டகம் வாழ்ந்ததில்லை அதுவும் சங்க இலக்கியம் சொல்ற மாதிரி வாழ்ந்ததில்ல சங்க இலக்கியம் என்ன சொல்லுதுன்னா வணிகர்கள் தங்களுடைய வணிக சுமையை ஒட்டகத்தின் மேல வச்சு பாலைவனத்துல கூட்டு போகும்போது அது ரொம்ப குளப்பட்டினியா கிடந்து பசிக்கு ஒண்ணுமே கிடைக்காம அங்க ஏற்கனவே செத்து போயிருந்த மிருகங்களுடைய எலும்பு வெள்ளையா இருக்க எலும்ப வந்து கொறிச்சு திங்க ஆரம்பிச்சிருச்சு அப்படிங்கிற ஒரு காட்சியை சங்க இலக்கியம் சொல்லுது இதை நான் தேடி 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 கடைசியில ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பத்துலயும் தேடி கடைசியில ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பதினெட்டுலயும் பாகிஸ்தான்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒரு ஒட்டக ஆராய்ச்சி நான் ராஜஸ்தான்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒட்டக ஆராய்ச்சி நிறுவனத்தையும் நான் தொடர்பு கொண்டேன் பாகிஸ்தான்ல இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒரு ஒட்டக ஆராய்ச்சி நிறுவனம் ரொம்ப தெளிவா சொன்னா ஒட்டகக்காரங்கள்ட்ட பேசினேன் பைனலா என்ன தெரியுதுன்னு கேட்டீங்கன்னா அது பாஸ்பேட் பற்றாக்குறையினாலும் பட்டினி கிடந்தாலும் டோட்டலா வந்து அதுக்கு வந்து உணவு இல்லாம போச்சுன்னா அது எலும்பு திங்குது அதுக்கு ஆஸ்ட்ரோபகின் பேரு அது வந்து கிட்டத்தட்ட ஒரு பற்றாக்குறை விட்டமின் டெபிசியன்சி மாதிரி இதை பற்றிய தகவலை கொடுக்கிற ஒரே இலக்கியம் இந்திய துணை கண்டத்தில் தி ஒன்லி லிட்ரேச்சர் விச் கிவ்ஸ் தி ஃபேக்ட் தட் தி கேமல் வில் ஈட் தி போன் is not a sanskrit literature is not a hindi literature it is not marathi literature it is only tamil literature the question is that how tamil literature 2000 year back 2200 year back which know the one of the most important uh, aspect of the uh, camel which only the camel uh, rearer only know it and second thing also yak's food habit it is eating for a particular uh, grass which only sangam literature says i also done an another mapping i think those uh, you people who are those who are in the airline industry may be knowing something called wind rows when you construct a airport you, you you to set up the which way the runway which direction which direction so they will have a which way to make the approach then you mean ninga paathirupinga or kaathla vande or thuni parandukittirukom and the parandittirukka thuniya vande that's basically um, so that is based on wind rows so in sangam sanga ilakkiyam even today tamil nadu we always say that vadakil irundhu veesum vaadai kaatru therkil irundhu veesum thendral kaatru merkil irundhu veesum kodai kaatru appdi solittu andha merkil irundhu veesira kodai kaatru vande anala irukku nu sanga ilakkiyam eludhudhu ana innikku irukka tamil nadu la vande merkil vande merku todachi malai dhaan irukke ange anal vai kodai appdi theela erichittu pora mariyana kodai vande innikku irukkuriya tamil nadu geography la no way அதுல சங்க இலக்கியத்துல சொல்லுது மேற்கில் இருந்து வருகிற கோடற்காட்டு மணல அள்ளிட்டு வந்து ஒரு பண மரத்துல பாதிய மூடிட்டு போயிருச்சுன்னு சங்க இலக்கியம் சொல்லுது அப்படிப்பட்ட காற்று வந்து சிந்து ஜாகிரபில தான் ஆந்தி காற்று லூ காற்றுன்னு ஒரு காற்று இருக்கு வடமேற்கு இந்தியாவில பாகிஸ்தான் சைட்ல இருந்து வரும்போது அப்படியே ஒரு மரத்தை கூட பாதிய மண்ணை வச்சு மூடிட்டு போயிரும் அவ்வளவு அனல அடிக்கும் ஆக வடக்கில மேற்கில் இருந்து வீசுகிற கோடை காற்றும் வடக்கில் இருந்து வீசுகிற வாடகை காற்று அந்த வடக்கு வடக்கில இருந்து வீசுகிற வாடகை காற்றுல வந்து நண்டே நடுங்கி போயிருதுன்னு சங்க இலக்கியம் எழுது பறவைகள்லாம் அந்த கோடையை தாங்க முடியாம கத்தி அழுகுதுன்னு சொல்லுது ஆனா இன்னைக்கு இருக்கு தமிழ்நாட்டுல வந்து நமக்கு வடக்க இருக்கிறது ஆந்திராவும் தெலுங்கானாவும் கர்நாடகம் தான் அங்க நம்மளை விட அனல் ஜாஸ்தி அங்கிருந்து வடக்கல இருந்து வாடகை காற்று வீச முடியாதுன்னு சொல்லி இந்த சங்க இலக்கியம் சொல்ற ஜாகிரபி எது அப்படிங்கிறது இந்த விண்ட்ரோஸ் மூலமா ஐ ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ட் இட் சோ இந்த யாக் பற்றிய செய்திகள் அந்த விண்ட்ரோஸ் இன்னொன்று வந்து ஒயில்டு ஆர்ஸ் அப்படின்னு சொல்கிற நம்ம வந்து கோவேறு கழுதைன்னு சொல்கிறோம் காட்டு கழுதைன்னு சொல்கிறோம் இந்த காட்டு கழுதை இந்தியாவில் இருக்கிற ஒரே இடம் வந்து குஜராத் இருக்கக்கூடிய கட்சி பகுதி தான் அங்கே தான் வந்து இதை வந்து ஒரு ஒயில்டு ஆஸ் இருக்கு இந்த ஒயில்டு ஆஸை பற்றிய பொறிப்பு வந்து சிந்துவெளியில் வந்து சிந்துவெளிக்கு குதிரை தெரியாது சிந்துவெளிக்கு வந்து சிங்கம் தெரியாது சிங்கம் இல்லை புலி தான் இருக்கு சிந்துவெளிக்கு வந்து இந்த இந்த காட்டு கழுதை தெரியும் சங்க இலக்கியத்துல ஒரு காட்டு கழுதையினுடைய கோவேறு கழுதைய டொமஸ்டிகேட்டட் பண்ண கோவேறு கழுதையில ஒரு தலைவன் தன்னுடைய காதலிய பார்க்க திரும்பி வரும்போது அந்த கழுதையினுடைய காலை வந்து ஒரு சொரா மீன் கடிச்சிருது சொரா மீன் குட்டி 
அதனால அது நொண்டிக்கிட்டே ஓடுதுன்னு சங்க இலக்கியத்துல சொல்றான் அதுவும் ஒரு இருங்கலில அப்படின்னா பேக் வாட்டர்ல இந்தியாவிலேயே ஒரு காட்டு கழுதையுடைய கால ஒரு இருங்கலில ஒரு சுறாவுடைய குஞ்சு கடிக்கிற ஒரே லொகேஷன் இந்த கட்சி இடம்தான் ஏன்னா தட் இஸ் தி ஒன்லி பிளேஸ் வேர் தி தி வேல் சார்க்ஸ் ஆர் பிரீடிங் நோ வேர் எல்ஸ் ஸோ திஸ் இன்சிடென்ட் குட் ஹவ் டேக்கன் பிளேஸ் ஒன்லி ஃப்ரம் தேர் ஸோ சங்க இலக்கியங்கிறது வந்து அன்னைக்கு நடந்த அன்றாட நிகழ்ச்சிய பதிவு பண்ண ஒரு நியூஸ் பேப்பரோ அல்லது ஒரு 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 வெப் ரிப்போர்ட்டிங்கோ கிடையாது இணைய ரிப்போர்ட்டிங்கோ அல்லது நியூஸ் பேப்பரோ அல்லது டிவி சேனலோ கிடையாது சங்க இலக்கியம் வாஸ் தி டாக்குமெண்டேஷன் எஃபோர்ட் ஆஃப் தி லாட் ஆஃப் கேரிட் ஃபார்வர்ட் மெமரி ஆஃப் தி சிவிலைசேஷனல் பாஸ்ட் இட் கண்டெய்ன்ஸ் தி ப்ரெசன்ட் இட் வாஸ் கண்டெய்னிங் தி பாஸ்ட் இப்போ நம்ம மகாபாரத்தை பற்றி ஒரு டிவி சீரியல் எடுத்தோம்னா மகாபாரதம் இப்போ நடக்குது அப்ப நம்முடைய கேரிட் ஃபார்வர்ட் மெமரி பழைய கதையை வச்சு எழுதுறது மாதிரி தான் சங்க இலக்கியம் இஸ் வாஸ் தி கேரிட் ஃபார்வர்ட் மெமரி இதுல வந்து சங்க இலக்கியத்துல வந்து ஏழியில் குன்றம் அப்படின்னு ஒரு பிளேஸ் தட் மீன் பிளேஸ் ஆஃப் தி செவன் ஹில்ஸ் அது வந்து நன்னன் என்கிற ஒரு மன்னனுடைய ஊரு பொன்படு கொண்காணத்து நன்னன் நாங்க அதை ட்ரேஸ் பண்ணி மகாராஷ்டிராவில் பிடிச்சோம் இந்த இடத்துக்கு பேர் வந்து சப்த ஸ்ரீங் சப்தனா ஏழு ஸ்ரீங்னா கொம்பு செவன் ஹார்ன்ஸ் இந்த ஹில் வந்து கொண்காணத்துல இருக்கு நன்னனுடைய சொந்த ஊரு நன்னனுடைய ஊர்ல இருந்த மலை நன்னனுடைய ஊர்ல ஊர் நதின்னு சங்க இலக்கியம் எதெல்லாம் சொல்லுதோ அந்த கொத்தை வந்து இந்த இடத்துல கண்டுபிடிச்சு சோ பொன்படு கொண்காணத்து நன்னன் அப்படின்னு சங்க இலக்கியமே சொல்லுதுன்னா அந்த கொண்காணம் எங்க இருக்கு மதுரை பக்கத்திலே இருக்கு ஆக திஸ் இஸ் தேர் தட் மீன்ஸ் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சருடைய ஜாகிரபி இஸ் நாட் எக்ஸாக்ட்லி கோ டெர்மினஸ் வித் தி ஜாகிரபி ஆஃப் தி ஜாகிரபி வேர் இன் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் வாஸ் கம்பைன்டு நம்ம சொல்ற வடவேங்கடம் தென்குமரி ஆயிடை தமிழ் கூறும் நல்லுலகம் அப்படின்னு நம்ம வச்சிருக்க இன்னைக்கு ஜாகிரபி மெட்ராஸ் பிரசிடென்சியா இருக்கும் போது வேற ஜாகிரபியா இருந்தது அப்ப ஆந்திரா பிரிஞ்சிட்டு போனது கூட அவருடைய நம்ம எல்லை மாறிச்சு இட் டஸ் நாட் மீன் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் டாக்ஸ் ஒன்லி அபவுட் தி கரண்ட் தமிழ்நாடு தட் இஸ் ரீசன் ஐ எம் ஐ எம் கன்சிஸ்டன்ட்லி இன்சிஸ்டிங் இன் ஆல் தி பிளாட்ஃபார்ம் சங்க இலக்கியம் தமிழ் தமிழ் மொழி என்பது ஒரு மாவட்டத்தின் மொழி அல்ல தமிழ் மொழி என்பது ஒரு மாநிலத்தின் மொழி அல்ல தமிழ் மொழி என்பது ஒரு நாகரிகத்தின் மொழி சங்க இலக்கியம் ஒரு நாகரிகத்தின் புரிதல் சங்க இலக்கியம் பேசுகிற பாடல்கள் பேசுகிற ஜாகிரபி புவியியல் சங்க இலக்கியம் எழுதப்பட்ட புவியியலோடு நாட் கோ டெர்மினஸ் இட் கோஸ் பியாண்ட் தட் ஆக சங்க இலக்கிய பாடல்களின் புவியியல் சங்க இலக்கியனுடைய அரசியல் எல்லைகளுக்கும் அப்பாற்பட்டது அப்படிங்கிறதான் நான் இன்சிஸ்ட் பண்ண விரும்புறேன் என்னுடைய ஸ்டடீஸ்ல இதுல வந்து ஹலா சட்டசாயிங்கிற மராத்தியில தொகுக்கப்பட்ட ஒரு பிராகிருத இலக்கியம் இந்த மாதிரி இலக்கியம் சமஸ்கிருதத்துல எழுதப்பட்டது இல்ல இந்த இலக்கியத்துல சொல்ற ஓமையில இருந்து அதனுடைய கன்செப்ட் இந்த பாருங்க ஒரு பெண் காதலனுக்காக வெயிட் பண்ணிட்டு இருக்கான் அவன் எத்தனை நாள் போச்சு அவன் ஊருக்கு போய் எத்தனை நாள் ஆச்சுன்னு செவுத்துல கோடு போட்டுக்கிட்டே வச்சிருக்கான் இந்த செவுத்துலயே கோடு போட்டுக்கிட்டு இருக்கிறத வந்து சங்க இலக்கியத்துல வரும் அதுக்கடுத்து பிராகிருதத்துல வரும் அதுக்கடுத்து திருக்குறள் நாளொற்றி தேன்ற விரல் அப்படின்னு சங்க இலக்கியத்தை திருக்குறள்ல வரும் அதுக்கடுத்து என்னுடைய பன்மாய கல்வன்கிற புத்தகத்துல வாட்ஸ்அப்பில் தேய்ந்த விரல் நான் ஒரு கவிதை எழுதியிருக்கேன் இந்த நாள் இந்த எக்ஸாக்ட் இந்த அகநானூரையும் இந்த அகம் எழுநூறுங்கிற ஹலா சட்டசாகி இந்த ஹலா சட்டசாகினுடைய சாதவாகடர் பகுதியில வெளியிடப்பட்ட நாணயத்தில் ஒரு பக்கத்துல பிராகிருதத்திலும் இன்னொரு பக்கத்தில் தமிழிலும் ஒரு நாணயம் வெளியிடப்பட்டது கிட்டத்தட்ட ஒரு ரெண்டாயிரம் வருஷத்துக்கு முன்னால ஆக வந்து தமிழனுடைய பாஸ்ட் ரீகன்ஸ்ட்ரக்ட் பண்ணும் போது வி சுட் நாட் திங்க் ஒன்லி அபவுட் தி கரண்ட் ஜாகிரபி நீங்க இதுல பாருங்க மேல்சேரியில இருக்கக்கூடிய ஒரு சேவல் விழுப்புரம் திண்டிவன பக்கத்துல இது கேல்சேரி கீழ்ச்சேரியில இருக்கிற சேவல் இந்தியாவிலேயே ஒரு கோழி சண்டையில செத்து போன சேவலுக்கு எவனாவது ஒருத்த நடுகள் வச்சிருக்கானா அது தமிழ்நாட்டில் மட்டும்தான் தமிழ்நாட்டில் மட்டும்தான் சண்டையிட்டு செத்த மேல்சேரி கோழி சேவலுக்கும் கீழ்ச்சேரி சேவலுக்கும் நடுகள் ஒரு ஆயிரத்தி ஐநூறு ஆண்டுகளுக்கு முன்னால் வைக்கப்பட்டிருக்கிறது ஐந்தாம் நூற்றாண்டு ஏழாம் நூற்றாண்டு சங்க இலக்கியத்தில் கோழி சண்டை பேசப்படுகிறது ஆடுகளம் என்ற திரைப்படம் தமிழ்நாட்டில் தான் எடுக்கப்படுகிறது நீங்க ஆடுகளம்ங்கிற திரைப்படத்தை போய் நீங்க போய் குஜராத்திலேயோ இந்தியிலேயோ அல்லது வேற மொழியில் எடுத்தீங்கன்னா அவன் புரியாம ஓடி போயிடுவான் ஏன்னா அவனுக்கு வந்து இந்த கோழி சண்டைங்கிற பண்பாட்டையே உள்ள வாங்க முடியாது ஆக இதுக்கு வந்து சிந்துவெளியில தான் இங்க பாருங்க சிந்துவெளியில இதை வந்து ஐராவதம் சார் வந்து காக் சிட்டி கோயி கோழி கோழி நகரம் அப்படின்னு பேர் சொன்னார் நான் வந்து இது
இது இது வந்து நகரத்துக்கு உள்ளது இது நகரம் இந்த நகரம் இந்த கோழி சண்டைக்கு புகழ்பெற்ற நகரம் இது வந்து அரச அந்த ஒரு ஒரு ராயல் சிம்பிள் மாதிரி இந்த திமில் காளை இது வந்து புழு நோண்டி குப்ப கொன்ற கோழி கிடையாது சண்டை போடுற கோழின்னு நான் எழுதினேன் என்னுடைய புத்தகத்துல இதுக்கு அடுத்து இந்த தமிழ்நாட்டுல கிடைக்கிற சங்க இலக்கியத்துல கிடைக்கிற கோழி சண்டை பற்றி செய்தி புறப்பொருள் பண்பாட்டு மாலையில கிடைக்கிறது தமிழ்நாட்டுல கிடைக்கிற சிற்பம் கடைசியில வந்து ஆடுகளம் படம் இது ஒரு பண்பாட்டினுடைய தொடர்ச்சி நீங்க இதுல வேற எதையுமே இன்னொரு இடத்துல பார்க்க முடியாது நீங்க சிந்து வெளியில இந்த கோழி சண்டைக்கான சிற்பத்தை பார்க்கலாம் இதை விட்டீங்கன்னா சங்க இலக்கியத்துல மட்டும்தான் கோழி சண்டையை பத்தி சொல்லலாம் அதை விட்டா தமிழ்நாட்டுல மட்டும்தான் அந்த கோழி செத்து போன கோழிக்கு நடுகளை பார்க்கலாம் தமிழ்நாட்டுல மட்டும்தான் ஆடுகளம்ங்கிற ஒரு படத்தை எடுக்கலாம் ஆக இந்த தொடர்ச்சியை தான் நம்ம பார்க்கணும் இது வந்து சிந்து வெளியில கிடைச்சிட ஒரு பொறிப்பு ஒரு மாடு ஒன்னு ரெண்டு மூணு ஒன்னு ரெண்டு மூணு நாலு அஞ்சு பேரு அஞ்சு பேரோட ஒரு மாடோட மோதிரன் இதை பத்தி நிறைய எழுதியிருக்காங்க ஐராவதம் எழுதியிருக்காரு கனோயர் மென்ஷன் பண்ணியிருக்காரு இது அறிஞர்கள்லாம் இதை மென்ஷன் பண்ணியிருக்காங்க இது ஒரு மன்ற மனிதரோட சண்டை போடுறது நாங்க பார்த்தோம் இது வந்து ஒருத்தனையே தூக்கி அடிக்குதா அவன் வெவ்வேறு திசையில போய் விழுகிறானு பார்த்தா இது ஒருத்தன் கிடையாது நிறைய பேர் ஏன்னா ஒருத்தன் தலை இந்த சைடு இருக்கு ஒருத்தன் தலை இந்த சைடு போய் விழுகுது ஆக நீங்க பாத்தீங்கன்னா இது வந்து ஐந்து பேர் ஒரு மாட்டோடு மோதுகிறது இதை நாங்கள் ஃபாலோ பண்ணிட்டு இருக்கும்போது இன்னைக்கு இன்னைக்கு தேதியில் இன்னைக்கு இன்னைக்கு பகலில் வந்து பாலமேட்டில் நேற்று அவனியாபுரத்தில் நடந்துருச்சு இன்னைக்கு பாலமேட்டில் நாளைக்கு அலங்காநல்லூரில் ஜல்லிக்கட்டு நடக்கும் இந்த ஜல்லிக்கட்டு தடை செய்யப்பட்ட போது தமிழ் சமூகம் எழுந்து போராடியது இதில் இந்த போராடிய மென்பொருள் இளைஞர்களுக்கும் அந்த போராட்டம் நடந்தப்ப நான் டூ தௌசண்ட் செவன்டீனில் பெர்க்லி வந்திருந்தேன் பெர்க்லி பல்கலைக்கழகத்துக்கு வந்தேன் அப்புறம் தான் அங்கே இருந்தால் ட்ராக் பண்ணிட்டேன் இந்த இந்த போராட்டத்தை பண்ணவங்களுக்கும் நேரடியான ச ஜல்லிக்கட்டுக்கும் தொடர்பு இருக்கா இந்த பண்பாட்டினுடைய அடையாளமாக ஒரு ஜல்லிக்கட்டு என்ற மாட்டு சண்டையை எடுத்துக்கொள்கிற ஒரே சமூகம் இன்னும் பார்த்தீங்கன்னா மாடு சம்பந்தப்பட்ட இந்த பந்தயங்கள் அதிகம் நடக்கிறது இன்னைக்கும் கூட பாகிஸ்தானில் சிந்து பகுதியில் கர்நாடகாவில் கம்பாலான்னு ஒரு இது அப்புறம் வந்து ஆந்திரா பகுதியில் கேரளாவில் இதை விட்டீங்கன்னா ஜல்லிக்கட்டு ஃபார்மட் மட்டும் தமிழ்நாட்டில் மட்டும்தான் இதுக்கு இருக்கிறது வந்து இந்த பாருங்க இங்கே பக்கத்தில் நீங்கள் பார்க்குறது கலித்தொகையில் இருக்கிற பாட்டு அதனுடைய ஆங்கில மொழிபெயர்ப்பு அதாவது குடலை உருவி போட்டதுலேருந்து பெண்கள் பார்த்துக்கிட்டு இருக்கிறதுலேருந்து காளை வந்து இருக்கவில்லை யாரடா முட்டலாம் நல்ல வீரனாக பார்த்து முட்டலாம்னு காளை நினைச்சது எந்த மாட்டை பிடிக்கலான்னு இந்த காளை நினைச்சது ரெண்டையும் காளை காலைன்னு சொல்லி இந்த கழித்தொகை பாட்டு இந்த கழித்தொகை பாட்டு வந்து ஒரு ரன்னிங் கமெண்ட்ரி மாதிரி இந்த ஜல்லிக்கட்டுக்கு இது வந்து ஒரு ரன்னிங் கமெண்ட்ரி மாதிரி ஒரு சிற்பியினுடைய ரன்னிங் கமெண்ட்ரி இது வந்து ஒரு புகைப்படம் இந்த படத்தை நாங்கள் எடுத்தது ரெண்டு மூணு வருஷத்துக்கு மேலே தான் எடுத்தோம் ரெண்டாயிரத்தி பத்தொம்போது ஜனவரியில் எடுத்தோம் இந்த புத்தகத்துக்காக இது இதுக்கும் எதுக்கும் இதுதான் வித்தியாசம் இருக்கா பாருங்க ஆக ஒரு தொடர்ச்சி வந்து கன்சல்ட் இது வந்து வன்னி மரம் இது இது வன்னி மரம்ங்கிறது என்னுடைய புத்தகத்தில் தான் நான் என்னுடைய கருத்தை சொன்னேன் இதுல ஒரு புளி இருக்கு அதுல வந்து ஒரு பெண் உட்கார்ந்துருக்கா அது வந்து பெண் தெய்வமா இருக்கலாம் அல்லது ஸ்பிரிட்டா இருக்கலாம் அல்லது ஒரு பெண்ணா இருக்கலாம் ஒரு குறியீடா இருக்கலாம் இது வன்னி இந்த வன்னி மரம் உயிரை காப்பாற்றும் வன்னி மரம் சாட்சியமாக இருக்கும் அப்படிங்கிற மரபு வந்து இந்தியாவில் தொடர்ந்து இருக்கு இன்னைக்கு நீங்க போய் பாத்தீங்கன்னா கேஜிரி அப்படின்னு ஒரு கிராமம் இருக்கு வன்னின ராஜஸ்தான்ல வந்து அந்த கேஜிரி கிராமத்துல வந்து இந்த சிப்கோ மூமெண்ட்டுக்கு முன்னால அந்த வன்னி மரத்தை வெட்ட வந்ததை வந்து பெண்கள்லாம் கட்டி பிடிச்சு அந்த மரத்தை காப்பாத்துறாங்க அவங்க செத்து போயிட்டாங்க அப்படின்னு சொல்லி இன்னைக்கு ராஜஸ்தான்ல இந்த கேஜிரி ட்ரீ தான் அந்த அரச மரம் சோழருடைய அரச மரம் இன்னைக்கு மைசூர் உடையாருடைய அரச மரம் சங்க இலக்கியத்துல வந்து வன்னி மரத்தை சாட்சியா வச்சது இந்த வன்னி சாட்சி தான் பின்னால அக்னி சாட்சியா மாறும் ஏன்னா இன்னைக்கு நம்ம கல்யாணத்துல வந்து இந்த வன்னி குச்சியை வச்சுதான் அந்த அக்னியை வந்து மூட்டுகிறாங்க அதே மாதிரி இந்த வன்னி மரத்தை சாட்சியா வச்சு நடந்த திருமணங்களை பற்றியும் சங்க இலக்கியத்தில் காதலை பற்றியும் சங்க இலக்கியம் சொல்லுது இதுல இந்த சிந்து வழி பொறுப்புல இருக்கக்கூடிய மூணு மரங்கள்ல ஒரு மரம் வன்னி என்பதை நான் குறிப்பிட்டிருக்கிறேன் இந்த வன்னி மரத்தோட தொடர்ச்சியை நான் நேரம் நிறைய நேரம் எடுத்துட்டேன் இது வந்து கீழடி கீழடியில கிடைத்த பொருள்கள் நீங்க சங்க இதுல சிந்து வெளியில கிடைச்ச பொருள்கள் சுருக்கமா முடிச்சலாம் இது வந்து பானை கீரல்கள் பானையினுடைய எழுத்துக்கள் இது வந்து இந்த ஒரு இதை சொல்கிறேன் இது வந்து கன சதுர பகடை அதாவது கியூபிக் டைஸ் இது வந்து ரெக்டாங்கிள் செவக பகடை இங்க கீழடியில வந்து இதுல டைஸ்ல இந்த டைஸ் வந்து ஐவரிலையும் கிடைச்சிருக்கு யானை தலையும் சுடுமண
ஒரு ஒரு பெண்ணுடைய மனசு காதலனுக்காக காத்துட்டு இருக்கும் போது அவருடைய மனசு சந்தோஷமா இருந்ததா துயரமா இருந்ததாங்கிறத இந்த பகடை விளையாட்டுல கிடைக்கிற டிஃப்ரெண்ட் நம்பரை வச்சே ஒரு இலக்கியம் சொல்லுது கல்தொகை அதுல சொல்லும் போது பத்து உருவம் பெற்றான் போல விளையாண்டுட்டு இருக்கும் போது ஒருத்தர் போது பத்தாம் நம்பர் கிடைச்சது பத்தாம் நம்பர் கிடைச்சவும் அவனுக்கு ரொம்ப சந்தோஷமா இருக்கு பத்தாம் நம்பர் எப்படி கிடைக்கும் இந்த இந்த பக்கத்துல இருக்கக்கூடிய இந்த செவக பகுதியில பத்தாம் நம்பர் கிடைக்காது ஏன்னா நீங்க எப்படி போட்டாலும் நாலு நாலு எட்டு அதாவது இதுல வந்து பத்தாம் நம்பர் கிடைக்கவே கிடைக்காது இதுலயும் நாலு அதுல நாலு வந்தா மேக்சிமம் வந்து எட்டு தான் கிடைக்கும் அப்ப பத்தாம் நம்பர் கிடைக்கிறா இருந்தா அது ஒரு கணசகர பகுதியா தான் இருக்கும் இந்த கணசகர பகுதியை பத்தி தெரியாதனால இந்த உரையாசிரியர்கள் நிறைய பேர் எழுதுனவங்க இது என்ன சொல்றாங்கன்னு புரியல ஒரு காலத்துல அந்த காலத்துல அப்படி இருந்திருக்குமா இருக்கும் அப்படின்னு எழுதுறாங்க ஆனா அதுக்கான விடை கீழடியில கிடைச்சது கீழடியில கிடைக்கிற பகடை லோத்தல்ல கிடைச்சிருக்க பகடை கழித்தொகை சொல்ற பகடை இந்த மூன்றும் ஒரே பகடை இதை விட ஒரு உதாரணம் இது வேற எங்கேயுமே கிடைக்கல நம்ம சொல்ற இந்திய வரலாறே பகடையில தான் தொடங்குது மகாபாரத பகடை நீங்க எங்க போய் முக்கி முக்கி தேடி பார்த்தாலும் அந்த பகடை விளையாட்டு நடந்த இடம் அந்த நடந்த அரண்மனை இதுக்காகலன்னா இப்ப ஒரு ஒரு ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கல் எவிடன்ஸும் கிடைக்கல ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கல் எவிடன்ஸ் கிடைக்கிறது சிந்துவெளி ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கல் எவிடன்ஸ் கிடைக்கிறது சங்க இலக்கியம் சங்க இலக்கியத்துல கிடைச்சிருக்க வரிய கையில வச்சுக்கிட்டே கீழடியிலையும் பொருணையிலையும் ஆதிச்சநல்லூர்லயும் போய் நின்றா அதுக்கு உரையை நீங்க வந்து இந்த இந்த வடிவத்துல பொருளுடைய வடிவத்துல பாக்கலாம் இந்த பொருளை கையில வச்சுக்கிட்டு சங்க இலக்கியத்தை தேடலாம் சங்க இலக்கியத்துக்கு எழுதுன உரை மாதிரி இருக்கு ஆக இந்தியாவை பொறுத்த வரையில் சிந்துவெளி பண்பாடு யாருடைய பண்பாடு அப்படிங்கிறதுக்கு சிந்துவெளியில கிடைச்ச மெட்டீரியல் வந்து ஒரு ஹார்ட்வேர்ன்னு சொன்னா ஒரு மென்பொருள் சொன்னா அதை டீகோட் பண்றதுக்காக மொழி நமக்கு புரியாம இருக்கலாம் ஆனால் அது எதன் எத்தகைய பண்பாட்டு அந்த பண்பாட்டின் குணம் என்ன என்பது தெரிவதற்கு அதை டிமிஸ்டிஃபை பண்ற டீகோட் பண்றதுக்கான சாப்ட்வேர் வந்து சங்க இலக்கியம் தான் சங்க இலக்கியத்தினுடைய துணை இல்லாமல் இந்திய பண்பாட்டை புரிந்து கொள்ளவே முடியாதுங்கிறதான் என்னுடைய ப்ரெசன்டேஷன் இது வந்து கீழடியில் கிடைச்சது இங்க நீங்க வந்து இதுல கீழடியில் கிடைச்ச பானை இதனுடைய சிந்துவெளி சைன் நம்பர் குறியீட்டு நம்பர் குறியீடு இருநூத்தி இருபத்தி அஞ்சு இந்த குறியீடு இந்த குறியீடு பாருங்க இது முன்னூத்தி ஏழு இந்த குறியீடு இந்த குறியீடு பாருங்க முன்னூத்தி அறுபத்தி அஞ்சு குறியீடு பாருங்க இந்த முன்னூத்தி பதினெட்டும் ஒரு 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 ஹை டென்ஷன் ஒயர் எலக்ட்ரிக் ஒயர் மாதிரி ஒரு கோபுரம் மாதிரி போட்டு கோடு போட்டு பாத்தீங்கன்னா இதெல்லாம் நீ ஈவன் இஃப் யூ ரைட் அண்ட் ஆல்கிருதம் ஈவன் இஃப் யூ டூ ஏ ரேண்டம் சாம்பிளிங் இட் கெனாட் it will get it will not happen accidentally what i am trying to say that a korkai vanji tondi mari na nootru kanakana idapeyargal vande ore kotta or adathula varradom adai patri ninaivugal ore ilakkiyathil indiyavinudaiya ore ore ilayakkiyathil sollapaduvadum angu kidaikira eluthukal kuriyidugal ipdi porundi povadum it cannot be accident idha dhaan na vande inda place names inda madurainudaiya vaiyai karaiyudaiya ரெண்டு சைட்ல வந்து இருநூத்தி தொண்ணூத்தி மூணு இடத்துல வந்து ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கலி பொட்டன்சியல் கண்டுபிடிச்சிருக்காங்க அந்த ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கலி பொட்டன்சியல் கண்டுபிடிக்கப்படுற மதுரையினுடைய ரெண்டு கரையிலையும் இந்த கீழ் மேல் அப்படின்னு அமைஞ்சிருக்க பேர் மட்டும் கீழப்பணங்காடி மேலப்பணங்காடி கீழ் கு கீழ குயில்குடி மேல பயில் குயில்குடி கீழூர் மேலூர் இந்த மாதிரியான இடத்த பேரை மட்டும் எடுத்துட்டு இதை வந்து சிந்துவெளியினுடைய கீழ் கேக்கு மேல் மேல் மேற்கு கீழ்கிழக்கு டைக்காட்டமியோட நான் கம்பேர் பண்ணி எழுதியிருக்கேன் இதோட நான் முடிச்சுக்கிறேன் ஐம் சாரி ஐ டூக் லாட் ஆஃப் டைம் கே என் தீட்சித் அப்படிங்கிறவர் வந்து இப்போ நம்ம சொன்னோம்னா மதுரை கார் இவர் சொல்றாருன்னு சொல்லலாம் இவர் வந்து மதுரை கிடையாது ஹீஸ் நாட் ஃப்ரம் தமிழ்நாடு ஹீஸ் அ கே என் தீட்சித் இவர் வந்து இவருடைய சார் ஜான் மார்ஷலுடைய ஒர்க் பண்ணவர் நைன்டீன் தேர்ட்டி நைன்ல ஆர்கியலாஜிக்கல் சர்வே ஆஃப் இந்தியா உடைய டைரக்டர் ஜெனரலாக இருந்தவர் அவர் ஒரு டாக் கொடுக்குறதுக்காக சென்னை யூனிவர்சிட்டி வந்தார் அப்போ அவர் கொடுத்த டாக் வந்து புக்காக வந்தது அவர் சொல்றாரு at no great distance from these newly discovered places in the gulf of kambay abna gujarat la it was at the ports of kambay and broch that the carlilian industry of india was concentrated and the extensive use of this material in the indus city renders it almost certain that further investigation in the narmada valley will bring to light other settlements of that period considering that conch cell which is typical of the indus valley civilization and which seems to have been in extensive use in indus cities was obtained from the southeast coast of the madras presidency it would not be too much to hope that a thorough investigation of the area in tinnavelli district and the neighboring region such as an ancient sea port of korkai will one day lead to the discovery of some site which would be contemporary with or even little later than the indus civilization 
This is a talk by K.N. Dixit, Director General, Archaeological Survey of India, 1939, Place Chennai University, Madras University. Our Sunna Pecha Mutu Gate, Yara, the series are Apoye, Tondaram Changana, the Varlari, Epeo, Vilchapatru. You would have versed the Kupinala Kiladi, Tondaram Shadipinalayo, other Kedra, Evolo, Mutukatagan. Would not the Runda Pata Tondi Ting, a Tondra the Gundi Lane Shulter. Aha, the K and Ditch Sunda, if the one then Kanmuna, another the Gundi Kirde, and a Purta Rail Sindhuveli Vita Yedamum, Sangai Lakium, Tota Yedamum, Wundre. Sindhu Sindhuveli Panbatin, archaeological portal, Tadayangal, Menburul and Ra. If this is a hardware, the software to decode its Sangam text. Sangai Lakim Menbade, Tamil Nadu no day, Yelai Kul Vait Padike Vendi, Lakia Mille, Adi India Tunaikantar Kana, Lakia. Sangai Lakia Menbade, Tamil and Bade, Uri Mavat Latin Moliella, Ur Mani Latin Kuralella, I the Tunaikantatin Kural, Kadala Yarinda Moli. Malay Yarin the Moli, Fani Yarin the Moli, Utaham Ulumbe Tinum in the Wunmay Wunanda Ure Ilekium. In the end of Hale in Parta, India Tunak and the Varla try Sanga Ilekate, Tunay Lamal, Meted Kamudium in the Yarenum Nenaital, our girl Tumbay Vitu Vitu Valai Pirikirakal. Our own the year that been it is a it's like a wild chase. So Sangam literature is an inevitable reference material for reconstructing not Tamil past. This is an Indian post I would like to underline. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Manakam. Manandriya, I am not sure that you are 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 not sure your observations, please. Uh, so, you have already reviewed the um, the journey of civilization book and now uh, we all heard from him uh, directly so uh, your observations sir i think it's a uh, uh, I, I it's always absolutely fascinating to listen to uh, mr balakrishnan talk about the journey of the civilization uh, he the, the way that he has put together uh, in terms of uh, place names in terms of the mentions, a, a, a deep analysis of the Sangam literature, uh, you know, including the wind patterns and the mentions to things that that uh, uh, you that the Sangam poets would have known only if they had memories of other parts, the Harappan regions in their minds. These are absolutely fascinating, and I think uh, my book and my talk ended with the arrival by and large with the arrival of the last migrants and this takes that forward and uh, essentially tells us the evidence that we still have in terms of where did those uh, where, where did those people go where did their language go where did their culture go as we know people moved all over but the question is the surviving parts of that culture of that language uh, it is absolutely, you know, it's absolutely agree with him that uh, a critical part of if you are to reconstruct what happened in the intervening period, you can't do it without understanding the Sangam literature. In the entire uh, Dravidian uh, language community, the oldest and the richest uh, treasures are there in the Sangam literature. And I think that gives us the, the clues to understand uh, and how the Indian civilization unfolded once the uh, Harappan civilization uh, started declining. So it's absolutely fascinating. I agree completely with him. Sir, uh, one small question. So we, I think we'll start, Balakrishnan, sir, um, we'll start with more questions. I think uh, there are questions coming in. So one of the things I'll start with my own uh, thing uh, I had in mind. So like the journey of civilization, which traces the evidences, right? The physical evidences or the language uh, traceabilities or the literature connections. The hardcore or the currently more acceptable thing is genetics, right? So, Tony, sir. So, can't we just really match up the things? Um, and I think uh, in from Kiladi, the samples are coming in, and there is a plan in uh, through MK University and uh, University of Chicago. They are going to do a joint research 
um, and if your team or like uh, who and all did you work with? Like David Reach is one of them. We always uh, uh, see in your book, uh, and we can infer. So we want to. Would that be the final answer to the question? Like yes, there are evidences like through the journey of civilization, which has put the road forward. But genetics would be one of the direct answers because it can be easily comprehensible. I am not. I do not think so because I, yes, you are talking. Genetics is uh, especially extremely useful when you are looking at prehistory and population movements, which caused uh, uh, groups which were not in contact with each other to come into contact, and you can see that. And without genetics, it would have been very difficult to find out how those happened. But once, uh, as my book says, all the major components of the Indian population are already in, at least by 1500 BCE. At least by 1500 BCE. After that, what we see as a significant mixing of people. Now, if you study further genetic, uh, uh, you, you can understand probably to some extent what the migrations happened and things like that. But the rest of the, the in the periods that follow, I think much greater, uh, uh, what shall I say, insight will be gathered from the study of, uh, of literature, of archaeology, and all of that. Genetics will also help. I'm not saying it won't help. It will also be a significant, but not, but not as much as in the case of prehistory, where that's the only thing that you have to reveal what happened. Today, uh, after that, we do have many other parts of the, of the puzzle that we can use significantly. Yeah, I will, I will answer that question uh, partly. Uh, as uh, Tony rightly pointed out, for the uh, prehistory, uh, and particularly remote prehistory, uh, genetics will be of great help. To some extent, archaeology, that means uh, without even knowing that uh, who made it and what is the language we spoke. So, so archaeology will not show unless somebody able to read some script. So that, that, that is the primary. That means the literature and other aspect will not be available. But when it comes to the uh, historical period, uh, the multidisciplinary evidence, because for example, suppose tomorrow in Keledi, uh, some trader had come from the northwestern India and he died there. Suppose he's, uh, he's uh, suppose in Adi Chiralur already found that uh, the remains of the bone and uh, remains belong to different. Some people have written that some monglide element, this element, that element. Suppose uh, tomorrow in the Madhuri vicinity, uh, somebody's uh, DNA which uh, tallies with the uh, people, person who lived in the Indus Valley side, or in the North India, I would only feel that he is a trader, he was in touch. The same way uh, some Tamil trader must have gone to uh, Bahrain or somewhere uh, even. So that will not be a conclusive thing. In the in the historical period, in the last 3000 years, that's a thing. It's a oral traditions and literary traditions, archaeology and a multidisciplinary evidence read with the genetics. It should be a kind of multidisciplinary approach. Great, sir. I was seeing a great no when I was asking the question from you. So, the, so the, I think we are underestimating and undervaluing the Sangam literature. That's what I'm uh, hearing from you and both Tony, sir, because it's all very detailedly written and it's just um, the present uh, uh, the Tamil community is not. Uh, the, the, the reason being, uh, before uh, Vaidegi Herbert putting the whole Sangam literature, which is readable in the internet, uh, easily, freely available land Sangam literature, A.K. Ramanujam had some, uh, some uh, selected poems translated. So, where, when did we do a, a translation of Sangam literature in other languages, the way we spoke? Where do we do a constructive translation? So it is high time that first people should read it. So it should be read in German, it should be read in French, it should be read in English, it should be read in uh, Hindi, it should be read in every language. So then people would understand, oh my God, the bone is a camel is eating bone. So then our own people did not. Because see, in 1948, somebody did a PhD thesis in the Palaitinai Padalhal, that means desert poetry. 
in and a phd is done the sangam literature talks about camel and it's eating bone and but it is not mentioning even the camel word then m varadarajanar he wrote a book about the treatment of nature in the sangam literature and he mentions about the camel and javier uh, tadinayaga madigal so all this uh, early thing the question why it why eat the bone and how the sangam poet know it that question was not asked so we but for that because the reason being we were basically looking at the sangam literature only within the our known domain that mean our known confines that mean vadavengadam tengumari aidai tamilgorum nalladagam we put our own self imposed boundary that mean as if today you go and ask that the pari as a kadaiyelu vallalgal so he belong to this district or whether he was living in kodaikanal hills or whether he was living in uh, eastern ghat you know you cannot confine because the pari and kadaiyelu vallal belongs to the entire tamil pre history that means carried forward memory so we were actually approaching tamil literature sangam literature as a tamil literature only it is written in tamil but in my view it's an indian subcontinental literature it is an indian subcontinental carried forward memory it is a indian subcontinental experience basically probably suppose suppose somebody is putting some knowledge uh, into sanskrit it doesn't become the experience of sanskrit suppose silpa shastra uh, i went to Maha, mahabalipuram i met the sculpture student uh, i asked them silpa shastra written in uh, sanskrit how many of you read sanskrit or no sanskrit uh, not a, not a, not a person because that mean but it is written in sanskrit so that mean suppose i translated certain particular knowledge if i speak to a potter and how do you know, know do your pottery and i write that in english and i and he is not become english man his experience has been now converted to a language so that means sangam literature is our subcon indian subcontinental memory experienced by the harappan and post harappan people very brilliantly documented because they felt the ownership unless they are very much felt the ownership why he is going to write why the, the tolgapi is going to be worried why a sea camel he camel and baby camel should be called why why he should define it unless he is in the uh, the camel was the part and parcel of the experience collective experience of the group of people why it will find the place in grammar as well as literature this is the way we have to look at it we have to ask, have to ask a question how how come if from the north of tamil nadu a chill bone chilling wind will come from north of tamil nadu only a bone melting hot wave will now come <laughs> we have to ask that kind of questions sure sure <laughs> sir. sir now i uh, will uh, ask um, from our special guest uh, sundra bandian he is from from fetna I mean, you know, federation of north american association uh, he has some question and uh, I'll, i'll invite him sir yeah thank you very much uh, rbi yeah, antonia yeah, for a wonderful presentation actually you. You, you took that 60000 years of our history as a flashback within one and a half hours thank you very much for that uh, yeah my question is about uh, i mean the other uh, contradicting theory uh, I, I, i have few questions basically uh, the harvard uh, uh, harvard uh, scientist uh, michael witzel actually he is postulating that munda uh, proto munda language is the uh, uh, root uh, base language for the harappan and mohenjodara and he claims that uh, the pre i mean the early vedic uh, text contains very few dravidian words and later vedic uh, text contains a more dravidian words and that that could be the one of the reason and uh, and also since the, uh, uh, when tony uh, mentioned about the uh, munda language he told about it came around 1500 years before he into india so when we compared with the tamil uh, sorry dravidian languages and the uh, munda language which has the more evidence like uh, the basis for the uh, 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 for the harappan language that's my first question uh, and my second question is uh, uh, I, i mean uh, this is regarding the astralo uh, melanesian uh, race so i mean is there any uh, how much uh, similarities uh we have the genes of astral uh, melanesian race with the uh, andaman and uh, south indian 
and other uh, other places and okay. also is link between the munda people and the uh, as melanesian people uh, i will first answer the, the i mean yeah uh, uh, thanks to that about the first uh, question witzel i think has been talking about paramunda not necessarily munda but uh, paramunda as the language that may have had more interaction with uh, with the uh, proto uh, with the indo european languages when they came in first but the recent genetic studies which revealed uh, the, the, the the how the austroasiatic languages spread makes it fairly clear that they reached india after 2000 bce so the likelihood that the munda languages themselves uh, interacted with the indo european languages is less uh, the when exactly the early vedic uh, there have been multiple theories about uh, the nature of, uh, of of interactions between the early uh, people who came in as migrants and the existing people. Uh, according to one of the uh, theories, for example, the people who wrote the early Vedas may not have been the first uh, migrants from the steppe. So by the time the people who wrote the Vedas came, uh, they are already interacting with the earlier migrants and other people. So they may not. They're, they're, so the interact. So the impact of the Dravidian languages that is reflected in the early Vedas may not be uh, because the Vedas could have been written much later. So, but these are things that are yet to be understood. I think uh, more genetic studies in the future would probably bring out uh, a greater understanding of this number of migrations or stages of migrations that happened the idea that there have been multiple one thing we know for sure is that there were multiple migrations from the step not one because we are talking about a very large period and it is incorrect to think of them all as as homogeneous as one group they were we also know that they are fighting against each other a lot of the time between themselves we also know that uh, the languages in the eastern part, Indo-European languages on the eastern part are quite different from the uh, Indo-European languages that are today spoken in the central. So there already are multiple versions of, so the idea that the people who wrote the Rig Veda are not the first wave of migrants, but were later migrants is a, is a clear possibility. But some of these questions you will get clarity uh, only later on. About the, we today do not really talk about in terms of races, because that's a word that has got outdated. Why has it got outdated? Because all population groups we know are mixtures. And all population groups today are mixtures of previous population groups. And those previous population groups, when you look at, we'll find that they were mixtures of earlier uh, groups. So there is no, no pure race. That's a, that's a, that's a myth. Uh, as far as the relationship of the first Indians, what my book calls first Indians, uh, the thing is that those the, the first Indians who may, who left onwards to the east to go on to Southeast Asia, Australia, all of that, that split happened tens of thousands of years ago, maybe fifty thousand years ago, but probably more. So they are they are all related, but then all of modern human, humans or we are all related. But if you're talking about distinct uh, di uh, divisions that happened 30,000, 40,000 years ago, uh, it is difficult to look at them as close relatives anymore. But there are distinct, there are, there are distinct connections. And some of these connections may even be visible in the myths that are carried by these people. It would be an interesting thing to look at. And in, to some extent, even in, the, in uh, deep language, but uh, but we have but to look at them in in as races would be different but yes affinities is something that we can still talk about so mr pandian i would like to say uh, i don't believe that uh, the entire uh, area of this uh, indus valley civilization geography uh, uh, when it is the day to day life only one singular standard language must have been spoken which is not a fact. Even at that time itself, the linguistic diversity may be belonging to a one family, or even even uh, if if you even somebody comes with an evidence that uh, the Mundarian elements, uh, Austic elements, were at that time itself coexisting or in the fringes 
or there was an interaction there is it won't i won't be shocked so because even if you say that it's a dravidian language if a family was being spoken it is not necessarily all the languages are the exactly same standard but what is clear is that for the purpose of trade and governance they had a common lingua franca otherwise what will not happen the the brick everywhere 1500 kilometers or 1000 kilometer uh, distance each away the brick size is exactly the measurements are exactly so unless there is a clear bureau of standard was in existence such a standardization could not have taken place that means there has to be a link language so that how they communicated so then then i always say that a lot of people misunderstand uh, they try to construct the whole history of the dravidian linguistics family as a post harappan uh, event and they give a tag you know dravidian indus valley language was a proto dravidian okay i have a problem in accepting that uh, the dravidian proto dravidian they link they look only from the linguistics point of view but i have a difficulty in thinking that okay harappan was taking place there was one dravidian family then after that every language was split so that splitting of the language eh, i don't consider i am not i am not an expert in that i am not considering as a post harappan event alone because uh, that kind of uh, dialectical variation must have been uh, existence there itself the reason being if uh, the, i have, i have come across a primitive tribal groups in the orissa or in uh, jharkhand when i am dealing with a primitive language and primitive tribe their uh, vocabulary will have a limitation like let's like say they will have a vocabulary which the, which deals with the material where they come across their life experience they will not have a word for the foreign trade they will not have a word for the weight and measurement they will not have a word for the port because they don't have port so this i have noticed it through a single word for example nadu the word nadu in tamil it means the country suppose you ask uh, tony joseph who speaks malayalam natle evade suppose you ask him uh, which that mean which place are you from that mean it's there the nadu is that mean are you from india are you from africa that is not the question which place in the your place that mean there the nadu comes in the in a village or a place uh, you in tamil nadu there is a place called oratanadu in tanjavur oratanadu is not a country oratanadu is a village so when i say tamil nadu it's a it's a state when i say indian nadu it's a country when i say palnadu it's a multi multiple country when i say velinadu it's a foreign country when i say ulnadu it's a domestic country when i say ik nadu it's a united nations in tamil the nadu but where is you know where the nadu starts there is a tribal community mal pagadia in sundar pagad villages in bigar jharkhand i have been to that village you go and ask him is a dravidian language speaker you ask him what is your nadu he says he just show me a small stone put in the uh, agriculture field which he worships he say it's nadu why it's not it's a, then uh, you, you insist him say is nadkal nadkal mean natakal that means it's a nadkal for him there is no nadu exists beyond that then for i go to another tribe in orissa he says naju naju mean is a e pronounce e nato he will say e nato mean this from this village for him nadu is only his village so for that mean it's all start from nadudal that means somebody is a planting he plant a tree he plant a stone he plant a language he plant a territory he plant a jurisdiction he plant a, his fame name and fame everything becomes from that particular establishing so the variance is starting from a small stone to village to state to country so depending on the civilizational experience within a linguistics family some language that is the reason i find the sangam literature could not have taken place overnight and uh, the entire sangam literature experience process would not have started from a proto dravidian harappan existence and all happened after that thousand year no harappan civilization itself was a grown up we are not having that literature it does not mean that they were not having a literature and they had limitation in the writing medium there was no paper they can only write few words so then they will rather use a seal for the thing if if they have a poetry they will only sing they cannot write so that mean the poetry was the literature was in oral form so this continuum we have to dispassionately view uh, i that is the reason i am considering uh, rather i i i want to submit the through this particular thing, uh, uh, the presence of the um, Tony Joso, the whole thing which he is trying to emphasize in his remarkable book, and which I am trying to do it in my own humble way, 
that India is cannot be explained in a unilateral or an exclusive way. India had no past, no present, no future in exclusivism. India is a plural country right from the day one in terms of language, in terms of culture. So that is the reason in America, earlier people used to talk about the multiculturalism. People used to use a word called a, a melting pot. Everybody feel very happy that uh, unity and diversity. These are the poetic and cliche words. But uh, I don't agree that India is a melting pot or not America is a melting pot. America melting pot, what will happen if you put a few metals in alloy making process? So the metal will lose its individual identity. You will get a new alloy. India is not an alloy. I have a Bonda tribe, only 1,000 people living in Orissa. He has got a separate culture and I respect him. I respect every tribe. And so if you have respect for every tribe, his identity, you cannot talk about a melting pot. Okay. Then in America right now, another terminology is famous, that salad bowl. So because there's an Hispanians are there, Mexicans are there, and, uh, and uh, black Africans are there, and uh, Indians are there, Chinese are there. So people talk about the, it's like a salad bowl. In the salad uh, bowl, every every vegetable is there. It is equally present, but they are present in the same bowl. So it's a salad bowl. I don't agree with the salad bowl also. India is not a salad bowl. Because in salad bowl, you select it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an organic process. It's a post-harvest process. So you take a cauliflower, nice looking, carrot. You don't put a brinjal. You don't put a vendakai. You don't put a, this one, that one. So to make it to the salad bowl itself, it has to write a neat exam. It has to go through a merit process. So I don't consider that India is a salad bowl, but I consider India as a rainforest. You go to Western Ghats. In the rainforest, the lowest layer, you will find fungi and small, small insects and a posse and a fungi and all will be there. Organisms will be there. Then there will be another small, small, small uh, scrubs. Then uh, insects are there, butterflies there, another height uh, monkey is there. Another kite and another monkey is there. So that means in the rainforest, it is a part of the whole and whole of the part. Everything coexists in their own domain. They interdependent. Indian culture is exactly like that. Indus Valley civilization also was exactly like that. That is the reason you find a foreign going a trader also is there. And some other primitive things also happening. Jalligat also taking place. So in Tamil Nadu also, Jalligat also taking place. Software industry also is there. So we have to talk about the rainforest. So the pluralism of India is a rainforest pluralism. That is what the journey of civilization trying to emphasize. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. A very good explanation. Thank you. So anyone else? I think uh, we have Nadraj, uh, uh, sir, joining from um, East Coast. So we have uh, Sundar from West Coast, Pacific, and uh, Nadraj, sir, from East Coast, so it's really nice to see people from all directions joining. Um, so, Adrat, sir, uh, if you are ready, then uh, we are we are ready for your questions, sir. I don't have any questions, but very interesting. I just came halfway, so I don't have any questions. I just listened to Tony Joseph's uh, talk about 15 minutes, then I thought it's life then. Uh, very, very, very nice talk. And then uh, uh, I have his book and then I read here and there. So <laughs> good, good, good. But, uh, we I'm... saw your uh, Facebook or social media comment and that thought uh, you, you are very much excited to uh, learn from them. So no, great, actually, great, great yeah, book. I'm just I'm just uh, I'm, I'm just curious about uh, um, uh, David Reach region um, reason. Um, ancient genomic studies how the ancient genomic studies are, are revealing and how it's going to change the out of africa uh, migration theories uh, i'm just curious about it uh, a lot of uh, contradictions are coming out from the ancient genomic studies from uh, david rich of uh, how it's uh, so any comment on that so uh, contradictions in terms of uh, i don't have anything i mean uh, there are some um, the migration could be uh, different from what we knew right now, so that's a still is still in progress. Um, but um, I'm just curious: is there any anything change because of his new studies showing that the European migration different from uh, what out of Africa? Just Not, a general I, question. No, 
Uh, I'm not uh, aware of that. I think we have much greater ident uh, uh, idea of how different world populations formed. Europe, for example, we now know that in the last 3,000 years, you know, the population churned over, uh, you know, th three migrations. Uh, and it is the result of three major migrations. The first, out of Africa migrations, which would have reached Europe around 45,000 years ago. These are uh, hunter gatherer uh, populations. And then there was a migration from uh, what, what is today Turkey and what was known as Anatolia earlier. These are farming populations which moved into Europe. That's around 9,000 years ago. That displaced or merged with, or, uh, or, or mixed with the earlier hunter gatherer populations. Then again, about 5,000 years ago, around 3,000 BC, the Central Asian populations that moved in and again uh, replaced or mixed with the earlier uh, farming populations and the, and the hunter-gatherer populations. Now, all of these has got much greater, uh, sharper definition because of the research that has been done by ancient DNA labs like that of uh, David Reich. And uh, similar things are going on in, uh, in terms of our understanding of uh, of the peopling of the americas or southeast asia and i'm sure that will continue but i do not think there is a so the the, the contradiction that you're talking about i'm not aware of maybe no 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 uh, i'm i'm just yeah. i'm just asking is that so all, all of these changes all of the changes existing understandings for example in europe because there was for a long time uh, archaeologists were resistant to the idea that there were uh, migrations that changed culture so they used to uh, refer to culture changes as not a result of migrations. But what has now, because of uh, ancient genetic research, ancient DNA research that has now brought out significant uh, migrations into Western Europe, those are, so, so earlier understandings have significantly changed because of new genetic studies. Okay, thank you, appreciate thank it. You. Great sir, great sir. Um, so um, we have Paulaya here, and he has uh, a question too. So thanks, Nadraj sir, for joining. And he's a um, he studies the gut biome, so he's also a deep researcher. So thank you, sir, Nadraj. Sir. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> sir. I just want to know yeah. if uh, either ASI or yeah. the Tamil Nadu government. Yeah, and uh, has uh, is cognizant of uh, all these developments uh, in archaeology and the DNA analysis and all that. And uh, are you getting any support or uh, any encouragement from them? We know uh, that the, the minister Tangam Pennarasi in Tamil Nadu is uh, quite a bit interested in the archaeological uh, analysis. Uh, I just want to know if that any, any support is coming from them or are they involved in any any of the uh, studies that you're doing? I think Mr. Balakrishnan would be better placed to answer that question. No, yes, uh, they are uh, actually, if you, the Kilidi and uh, Sivagalai and Adi Chanalur is a, Sivagalai and Kilidi is a best example. <laughs> Kilidi first, ASI started uh, first to two uh, round sessions. Then after that, there's a lot of uh, expectation came, then controversies came. Uh, then uh, So there's a lot of uh, demand. Then at uh, some stage, uh, there uh, yeah, some kind of opinion was given. There's nothing much to dig. But then people were not willing to believe that. Uh, then they insisted that government of India, government of Tamil Nadu came to picture. Then they started digging. They took a license because of, for uh, archaeology, you have to take every session, there is a license for the ASI. Even individual scholars and a researcher also can apply for it. Uh, so accordingly, Tamil Nadu government itself took over and then they did it. And then that is the reason the reports came very scientifically, the beta analysis, uh, different uh, international institutions, uh, opinion, scientific opinion was taken. I say that uh, things are fairly good. And Kiladi has created a huge awareness uh, during one session, I think, that last year, in a short period, uh, more than one and a half lakh people uh, went to Kiladi. Actually, I believe that more than government is doing a great job in the in the in in trying to unravel this. But I am a firm believer that the people are the custodian of this tree. 
uh, yeah, history will get unrevealed to that uh, to the extent the people taking a ownership. So Kiladi become a public movement, actually people movement. So they took a lot of foreign friends. Uh, those I am having a lot of friends in US and other places. They all came and made a visit to Kiladi, and there are I know people who took some soil uh, from Kiladi, thinking that I am carrying the Kiladi and all. I met the farmers who are the land owners. Uh, those people are taking pride that uh, I am happy that in my place history is still sleeping. So ultimately, it's a custodian of the history is the people because it's about the people's history and uh, the governments are showing greater importance. I think that now we are having a more than anything else. Uh, it's very difficult to suppress now anything. Actually, we are living in a scientific world uh, and then people keep working without any expectation. And uh, things are under uh, fine and uh, we are very hopeful. Uh, a lot of new things will come. It's only beginning. But only thing that, uh, as I already pointed out, that in 1939, somebody just as, uh, told that you dig it. So after that, not much of digging was done. And rather, even 1924 only, John Walker announced the Indus Valley Civilization. But uh, Alexander Ree found the Adi Chanalur in 1904, 20 years before Indus Valley Civilization. Adi Chanalur had a, a, the largest excavation took place in India was in Adi Chanalur. But there was no follow-up. But now things are changing. There's a lot of interest. Uh, the department is taking a lot of interest now. Okay, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, Tony, sir, when you are, uh, I, I alluded to that question earlier. So your early Indians book, which are the genetic researchers whom you really base it off? I think is David Rich one of the main uh, researcher whom you base your <laughs> Uh, no, there are a large number of genetic studies, which you will see in the bibliography of the book, which is a pretty, pretty large section. Uh, the, the, his DNA research lab had two particular studies, which were uh, critical. One is the formation of populations of South and Central Asia. Uh, the other that came out in 2019, after my book was published, uh, which is based on the uh, Harapan uh, DNA of a Harappan individual in Dagi Gadi. So both these were uh, critical, but all all of these, uh, but these were not the only studies that were uh, that were critical. But there were many others also which are mentioned in the book. Uh, there was a study which looked at which uh, looked at the uh, the you know the which came to the conclusion that. Uh, the, the, after the all the four uh, you know migrations happened, all the all the major components of the Indian population were in by around mm -hmm. 1500 BCE. There was significant mixing that happened between all of these populations until the beginning of the Common Era, and around the beginning of the Common Era, around 100 CE, uh, it the, it seems to be that the, this mixing came to a stop, and uh, and uh, the and. Uh, uh, and the practice of endogamy or the practice of marrying within one's community took off. And this is the result of a research. And that and endogamy is a distinctive feature of the caste system. So because of genetic research, we now have uh, as an approximate date when you can say that the caste system went big. I'm sure there were elements of it earlier practiced in certain communities or certain regions in a small manner. But around 100 CE, it just it grows, uh, goes big. Genetics can't tell you why it happened and what were the forces, historic forces that were driving it at that, that, that time, but it can give that time period. It is for the rest of the uh, disciplines that make up history to answer the question, what happened then for this to happen? Why did it go big then suddenly? I'm sure the answers are there uh, for us to find. They're all there. So, but uh, when you made the observation about Rakigiri, so yeah. I think that is a turning point, but what would make it a uh, greater acceptance in, in all of India? It's still being sidelined and I think, uh, we think it's sidelined, but is that, what would change really that kind of perception? Because we need to, it's, if, if whether it's Tamil language or whatever it is, it's, for Indian, it's a pride of India, right? Whatever the findings are. So yeah. what would make that change, you think? 
uh, I think uh, which we discussed earlier also. I think the idea, and this is the key part, the idea that Indian civilization is unisource has been disproved. That's what these researchers have shown. India is multi-source. Indian civilization is multi-source. It comes from multiple, his, multiple migration histories of people over long periods of time in prehistory. To, to digest it and to conflate it into all of Indian history, uh, a civilization is the result of uh, Sanskrit idea, Vedic culture. It's a tragedy. That's not true. That's, it's, it's not based on facts. The Sanskrit idea, Vedic culture is a significant part of Indian civilization, but it is not the uh, only one, and it is not the earliest. The Harappan civilization precedes it by far, and it was the largest civilization of its time. So to much of the opposition comes from the idea that uh, if we say that, uh, you know, so it comes from the wrong idea that, that we are unisource, and that has to go. And I think each of the new discoveries that is happening, whether it is in genetics or anywhere else, are telling us again and again that uh, India is a multi-source civilization and that we created a unique civilization uh, out of multiple migrations that happened in prehistory. And uh, my book, in fact, talks about how when you look at Indian civilization today uh, in, in its entirety, there are two things that, that strike you. One, the amazing commonalities that there are. Where do they come from? When you look closely, you will find a lot of those commonalities come from the fact that the Harappans moved all over the all over the subcontinent, taking their culture and many practices that were hewed in the Harappan civilization along with them. They were the source that spread over the base of the Indian demographic pizza. That's where many of the commonalities come from. But as striking and interesting as the commonalities are also the striking differences. For example, eating habits. For example, we now know today, today based on multiple research we now know that the east sorry north and west people in the north and the uh, west uh, drink a lot more milk than people uh, in the south or the east but we also know that they eat a lot less uh, meat or fish than people in the south or the east in other words people in the north and west get more of their animal protein from milk and much less from fish or meat and the reverse in, in the south and the east. What explains this difference? Now, we would, we would, you know, naturally we would tend to think these are cultural differences. Actually, they are not entirely cultural differences. Oh, to some extent they are, but they are also determined to a very good extent by genetic differences. We now know that there is a mutation that allows adult humans to digest milk into adulthood. All human uh, children can drink and digest milk, but uh, only a minority of uh, humans can drink drink and digest milk into adulthood, and that's that def that is made by uh, uh, that difference is made by a particular gene uh, that obviously de uh, developed after humans started started uh, domesticating animals. Now you will see that this gene to digest milk is prevalent more in northern and western India and far less in southern and eastern India. So why do, why do people in northern and east, western India drink far more milk? Because uh, the, more of the people there into adulthood can uh, drink milk. And it's, that also is not a majority in northern, northern and western India. That's also a minority. But it is just that the presence of that gene is far higher in northern and western regions than it would be in uh, south and the west. So you, what you're saying is that we have substantial similarities which are explained we have also substantial uh, dissimilarities which are a result of our migration histories and we need to uh, uh, we need to the, the, you can't run this uh, uh, this very diverse and very large population of 1.35 billion people uh, with uh, with an with, with ideas that are uh, that are centralized and which suggests that there is something divine or something uh, sacred or something, uh, uh, what shall I say? There's something to be great about a unisource civilization. There's nothing great to be about a unisource civilization. That we are a multi, uh, multi source civilization is something to be proud of. It's not a weakness, it's a strength. Great, great, sir. We have 
two more questions, sir. Uh, so yeah. we have Venkat uh, who have been waiting long. So uh, he's from Dallas and he's one of the committee members. Uh, Venkat, you can ask a question. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Vipri. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir. Uh, we learned a lot. Um, it was a very informative session. Um, my, I'm Venkatesh. I live in Frisco, uh, Dallas area. I'm from uh, Nagapattinam. Um, I have a simple question. As uh, Balakrishnan sir said, uh, people are the custodian, right, uh, for, to take in, uh, what we have in literature, right, especially in Sangam literature. And if you look at it in epic, uh, everyone knows in India, even my when I was a kid, I born and brought up in a very remote village where we don't have a technology, but I still know uh, we, we in our home, we have uh, books, epic books. My mom, my dad, and everyone says they read it, right? I, I've read yeah. through the entire book. But yeah. how do we take this literature, uh, the Sangam literature, yeah. to the common people, right? We we have to create awareness. Even I was trying to do, uh, I've, I've been here and I did not even get the opportunity. Also, I noticed a lot of motivational speaker, a lot of researcher, they use a lot of content from the Sangam literature. They don't even quote it or it is copied from there. Like now, if you look at it, a Thirukural, Thirukural was many people have written a, a, a translated in a simpler manner. If in a common man, if you wanted to read a Thirukural, not everyone can understand when it's very difficult. But because it's a popularity, because it has a translation of a simple uh, modern Tamil language, right? So how do we create an awareness? How do we take it to some literature into the uh, next generation or create a more awareness? And what we how to do? That's my question. Even I'm interested in a lot of information, but I did not get the opportunity to to uh, uh, to know about in detail. Yes, so should I answer that? Uh, yeah. First, we should uh, first we should uh, liberate Sangam literature from the clutch pure ag academics. Actually, we should understand that we need to reach people. We should uh, understand the difference between. Uh, reading and learning Sangam literature for a purpose of examination or research is different from uh, the requirement of a common man. So then uh, we should have two type of translation, I believe. Number one, the complete text, the way uh, Vaidhi Herbert has done in different languages. First, uh, as a truthful to the text, a complete uh, verbatim translation and easily explain. This is for the academic purpose, future research, everything. Second thing, we should uh, take a derivatives. What you derive from them, what you obtain. If you really look at it, Thirukural, uh, 1330 Thirukural, all the Thirukural, do you think that everybody can understand or everybody can repeat? No. If you really uh, ask uh, uh, anybody, we say you recall the takeaways from Thirukural, then he can tell 10 takeaways, 20 takeaways, 25 takeaways. So uh, depending on his interest and knowledge, people will say then uh, there are certain takeaways you will find it's a uh, common. Anybody who knows Thirukural will be knowing Karka Kasadara, something like this, uh, Inna Seidare Urutta, like that. So then from Sangam, that is the reason I made an attempt last year by bringing Sangha Churanga for 30 talks I was giving. So people should come in the different formats, uh, 100 takeaways. I, I delivered a talk, it's called 10 Commandments of Sangam Literature in Trichy uh, two years back. So why I use the word 10 commandments? Purposely, I'm using 10 commandments like a Bible. So I want to relate that uh, 10 things which is Sangam literature tells. So if we, somebody says that you ask me to tell 100 things Sangam literature say, I will elaborate my list. So we have to now start uh, talking about the important takeaways. That means so that uh, he first knows that such a refined thought, it was a uh, part of that. I will just give a small example. Yadum ure yavarum kehe. Tidum nandrum piradara vara vara periore vietalum ilame siriore igaldal adaninum ilame. I won't basically just go and appreciate or they fall at the feet or uh, greatly admire a fellow simply because he is a big, big fellow. But uh, more than that, I will not actually neglect or insult a fellow because he is uh, below me or he is a smaller to me. That means imagine. The whatever uh, learning which you want to do for the current society and generation, that means we are surrounded by psychophants. 
we are we get surrounded by the people who basically what i get from a person we have a tendency to insult the common people those who are below us the the pandemic taught us lot of lesson Uh, during this particular current society what sangam literature we did not put a cut out we did not say sangam literature is the greatest literature in the world no there is nothing called greatest there are good things everywhere there is a good thing in roman culture there is a good thing in mayan culture there is a every culture has got a great its thing but take away so i have a comic books can come uh, cartoons can come small story books can come in different languages so i would i would i am taking a take away routes uh, 10 take aways 25 take aways 100 take aways translate tell in uh, if possible i will tell in oriya if possible i will tell to my children in tamil then in english in french so like that we have to keep talking about it uh, how bhagavad gita become popular one max muller had he not come to india he would not have had a, somebody from abroad had not come we would not even know asoka do you know that 200 back year back we were not aware you tell me any literature written 1000 year back 1500 back, year back in sanskrit ever mentioned the name called asoka has it ever mentioned the name of uh, asoka tell me not at all asoka was unknown then some foreign scholar read that uh, pre, that uh, what you call devana priya priya dasi priya dasi that mean uh, there to god then he, he reads it and all the thing and finally the asoka was uh, discovered and mohan jodhara was first considered to be a buddhist stupi and adichiralur was not known sangam literature was not known and tirukural which king celebrated tirukural can you tell me one tamil king whether he is a chera chola pandya anybody who declared that a tirukural is my a kingdom's book no nobody nobody celebrated people celebrated so that is the reason i am telling custody sangam literature has reached it our hand in the form of the print in the form of uh, apps in the mobile in the internet because somebody kept on taking uh, sangam literature copy from one palm leaf to another palm leaf it will it will survive only 150 years so somebody without any expectation put their work so it is our duty is cast on us that uh, read it understand even 100 thing even uh, somebody knows 100 takeaways from sangam literature job is done that's what Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. All of us, one thing which connects all of us is uh, the Sangam literature. I think I also actually I was also brought in North India, and now I'm the president of Tamil Sangam here, and I did my graduation in Bihar, where the Munda tribes are more. So the i attended the actually his to his question i attended the sangam literature workshop by vaidya herbert in dallas which was actually fortunately sponsored by palaya so that's how i got attracted to oh, when there is so much in tamil we are like <laughs> we have been not been uh, got any evidence of the depth and breadth of tamil we are just making it yearly say nadagam right it's nothing it's more than that right so i think today i think um, when i ask that genetic is it going to be the sole solution but all of you are indicating that sangam literature is in front of you we need to give the importance and focus on that and it will help solve many of the puzzles by itself to the common man i mean so thank you thank you sir and i have but we have to be we have to be careful about one thing when we try to talk about uh, the sangam literature kind of thing we should not superimpose the current experience and current realities current current politics into it for example reconstructing the sangam past is is absolutely impossible without taking the archaeological further archaeology and uh, into in the in the what is now known as kerala so it is now become a kerala they speak malayalam it does not mean that you stop communicate you may have a mulai periyar problem with them it doesn't it should not be superimposed in understanding sangam literature i am really worried about it people people when i when you when you glory imagine silapadiyaram had such a great understanding silapadiyaram wants to make a statement it's a cultural politics it wants to make a statement see you know that what is the strongest politics not the electoral politics cultural politics as ilonga vadigal deals with a scenario he builds up a particular thing links the three cities one is chola where kannagi born pugar 
Madurai, Tondian capital, where they come to yet out a living to start a new business and get killed. Third, goes to the Vanji Chera country, where a sea departs as a goddess and then Sengutua a builds a temple. For that, he comes to know that he was insulted by, uh, the Tamil kings were insulted, not Chera. The <laughs> southern kings were insulted by Kanaga and Vijaya. Whether it's a fact or story, that is not important. I am telling about narrative. Then he goes all the way to North India and take the stone from Himalaya and put it on the back of the Kanaga and Vijaya, dip them in the Gangetic thing, make them to carry the stone and then make a statue of the Kanagi out of it. Will it really happen? Will, will 1,800, 2,000 people, some king will be carrying stone. But whether it is a narrative, who is doing that narrative? You go to uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, they said uh, Kanagi did not go from Madurai to Kerala. She directly came to Sri Lanka to cool. So there is a huge temple. Today, Sri Lanka has got a maximum Kanagi because Tamil people travel. So the stories travel. So then we would, then, but whereas Silongavadi builds up a narrative linking three kingdoms, Kerala, Kola, Pandya, three cities, one story, one character. So he builds a strong political narrative, cultural political narrative. So when you understand a thing, we should not superimpose the current issues in the historical past. That's a, that is what I am, we are all facing, but we will certainly handle that. Because that's very important, we have to keep it in mind. Yeah, exactly, sir. As without Patnam, the most of the yeah, Tamil. That's what I'm telling. <laughs> if we say that Kerala and isolate, none of the Tamil uh, thing will come out. So that uh, makes an excellent point, sir. So yeah, that, that we should do the digging. Do you know that where we should do the digging? We should do the digging in Maharashtra. We should do digging in Gujarat. We should do digging in uh, digging in Karnataka, Andhra, and Telangana to understand Tamil properly. Let me tell you. Yeah. Sure, sir. Sure. We have a last question from uh, Guna, sir. He is also from uh, California. So I'll bring him in, sir. Thanks, Guna, sir, for joining. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for a uh, wonderful uh, session, sir. I was uh, listening for the last two hours. I think it's kind of really mind boggling, though. Uh, I have a quick question to uh, uh, Balakshan, sir. Uh, with regard to the routes and then routes, though, um, I kind of read your uh, book also, but I have a one basic and then fundamental question, though. Uh, why we didn't uh, find any evidence in between Indus Valley to Tamil Nadu? So basically, the, my rational began that question is, you know, when the humans are migrated from uh, Africa to through the coastal area, all the way from wherever we see Harakin and then Mukajadara culture, everything, you know. But we see a little bit of disconnect between Indus Valley to Tamil Nadu. So why we didn't find any other traces, though? I believe there must be a trace like what we found in Sangam literature. Similar to that, somewhere in between also we should have found it. But why we didn't there is it because there is no evidence or no literature or that itself is a kind of a uniqueness how we carry it from uh, past to present all the way now where we are. So I would like to have this kind of a human, when human migrate, you know, always we'll see a trace though. Why we didn't see in between? Okay, the answer is yes and no. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, it is not a fact that uh, uh, no links are found in between. Links are found in between. Uh, in archaeological term, I will consider Daimabad in Maharashtra where the uh, continuity of the Harappan. Harappan, Mohanjadara does not mean that in the Pakistan Northwest, uh, Maharashtra is far away, Lothal far away. And we have done the digging in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Daimabad in the 60s. I would only say archaeological apathy as the reason uh, why further evidence not found uh, south of uh, Daimabad. That means as if the southern outpost of the Indus expansion stopped at Daimabad for the last 60 years, not further expanded. Imagine, suppose uh, Amarnath Ramakrishnan has not dug the uh, Keeladi. We would not have Keeladi. If somebody had, that means absence of evidence is not an evidence for the absence. That means we have not done enough digging. And uh, Daimabad we have dug, Keeladi we have dug. The similarities are so excellent. That means even writing, scribbling, everything. So it only underlines the need for further digging, dispassionate and very aggressive digging it is asking for. 
then there are certain evidence are already available i will i will cite an example of a literature called please google it is available the whole book is available as a pdf format for those who want to think i think it's an archive or a thing at all you just read that halas satasai a pdf you ask for it halas satasai i put one slide also it is a literature written in marathi prakrit now sometime around it is time given around 200 ad you can say around sangam literature time or a silapadigaram time it is 700 songs are there all love songs uh, something gets more physical than uh, sangam literature uh, more explicit but uh, i am telling you it's something like a thirai thinai thurai type of thing it is a that second thing it's about the common people's love life and uh, hugely the narrative idioms similes approaches everything like sangam literature to the extent that this khala satasai i call as aham 700 the way we call it sir aham 800 aham 700 i call it because the, if you put read a khala satasai and sangam literature you will find something called what you can call as a decon literary tradition why it is not found in other languages mean the other languages suppose uh, suppose people speak the language of the court literatures are written in the language of the court okay sanskrit uh, in which district in which kingdom uh, lakhs of people spoke it, it is not the language of a particular district or a particular state but then why all the literature is available in the uh, sangam literature sorry in the sanskrit language because it is supported by the court it is supported by the king it is supported by the elite so then suppose i am living in orissa in here this is this is the place where the kalinga war took place if the kalinga war had it not taken place near bhuneshwar the history of china tibet china and korea and japan would be totally looking different because from here hinduism buddhism was taken in a mission mode so but whereas it is such a good language in oriya is one of the classical language now when i come and see i i, I read write and speak uh, in oriya i done lot of research work about oriya language and the and the its history just 500 years back only literature available does it mean that people were not speaking and the people were not uh, having a oral literature such an excellent and deep rooted multiculture the reason being everything was being written in sanskrit so today like there is some language in bihar the, this those languages will be lost now they are giving space for hindi about 100 year back hindi was not popular today maithili and bhojpuri and marathi so many languages are under threat so that mean if it is the evidence is not found in those areas people lost their language and i i you please i have read one excellent book called dravidian maharashtra it is written by one viswanath kare and uh, two years one year back i spoke to him uh, he is some 90 plus i spoke to him over phone he says that uh, the the root of all the uh, maharashtra place names and the language is tamil he says he is a marathi man so that mean there was a continuous connecting link we lost it probably archaeological may be preserving culture take for example kinship terminology uravu peyargal akka amma mama uh, this kind of terminology from gujarat maharashtra uh, to tamil nadu you take it it will follow a pattern second thing the marriage uh, marrying the uh, murai maman that mean cross cousin wedding cross cousin wedding solla irukla akka magal indha mari kalyanam pandrathu indha cross cutting wedding if you put a map where it is looked down upon where it is done you will find a connecting thread of maharashtra and thing take the potter's life only quaver life i have studied the all the potters of india Uh, for my pot root uh, hypothesis i found that gujarat potter and orissa uh, and maharashtra potter entire south indian potter and orissa potter bengali potter and assam potter has got something in common in terms of culture disposition everything their style also this is known as the brw area block and red ware pottery area in this area they painted grey ware pgw which uh, which many scholars are identifying with the arrivals of the aryan this pgw never appeared here in this area there are many ways of establishing that is the reason i said answer is yes because that sufficient has not been done answer is uh, no in the sense that it is already available it is already available we have to further do it 
I would like to just to take this forward. Can you hear me? Yeah, uh, please. Uh, I would like to quote uh, from Professor Franklin Southworth's book called Linguistic Archaeology of South Asia, which has something to do with this, this, uh, this discussion. He says, whatever may be the case, we are probably justified in concluding that by the early first millennium CE, extensive areas of Gujarat, coastal Maharashtra, and southern Maharashtra were occupied by a population that used a Dravidian language for daily interaction, either as primary home language and slash or a lingua franca. A lingua franca. So essentially, he, he, he came, comes at his uh, conclusion based on uh, place names. And uh, place names are derived from uh, Dravidian languages. So I think that so it may not, so there are connections that link uh, that make this link clear. Great, great, sir. Thank you, Guna, sir, for the uh, question. Um, as a closing notes, we wanted to know. So today also for the Pongal, I think this is the inaugural uh, program for 2022 Pongal for Metropolis Tamil Sangam. We could have done any program, right? Normal programs like uh, a karaoke or concert or any party mandram or something. But we really wanted to emphasize um, the living legends. So you both of you coming together and sharing the together knowledge. But still, um, we could have like there are 10,000 families in uh, Dallas itself, Tamil families. But one basic question still remains. Why, what is the importance of history, right? Uh, I hear a lot of your lectures and you uh, quote the Terry Pratchett quote, right? Uh, Tony, sir. And so we really need to make people understand why we are trying to look back, right? So people all say, hey, okay, whatever it is, what is the value of it? Mm -hmm. So can you both uh, give an insight into why we are discussing this? What is the importance? And also, uh, give a what are the next project you both are working on so each of you if you can uh, let us know the importance of this whole effort because i can see both of you are dedicated your whole life for this right but both of you started in a different way but why is it important and why people needs to give importance to this tony sir first your observations i think uh, there's a positive way of looking at it and there is also a negative way of looking at it the positive way of looking at it is best reflected in the in the quote by Terry Pratchett, it said, if you don't know where you come from, you don't know where you are. And if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. Uh, and that's a very dangerous situation to be in. So that's one way of looking at it. If, because if you don't know where you're coming from, you don't know where you're going. Second thing is that uh, is a quote from, uh, from another historian, uh, Eric Hobsbawm of, of, of the United Kingdom who said uh, history is to nationalism what, uh, I, 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 you know, I'm paraphrasing it, I don't remember the exact quote, history is to nationalism what the, uh, the, the what drug is to a drug addict in the sense that uh, nationalists require the I think, uh, use was, history. Yeah. It was the Pakistan thing, right? Meaning That's right. Yeah. You had the they, they, yeah I, 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 it will take me some time to. I, I, I can't remember the exact. Yeah, word. I can read it out, sir. Historians are to nationalism what poppy growers in Pakistan are to heroin addicts. We supply the essential raw material for the market. I think that's what you have been quoting. <laughs> so, that's that. That's right. Basically, that so, is a present problem too. I think, right? That's right. Because national, the idea of nationalism uh, is created out of uh, myths, and that pretend to be from history. So, if you do not know the actual what the what, what the evidence is, what evidence there is uh, for history, and if you don't actively make sure that we understand history as it happened. Uh, in based on evidences, uh, then we are leaving the uh, room open for uh, demagogues of any kind in all societies. So history is absolutely important for us to know where we come from where we, and where we are going, and also to make sure that history is not misused for political purposes. So that's what I would say. Thank you. So what is your next project, sir? 
the next project i am working on my next book which i could I can say is a sequel to the first one because as i said the first book ends uh, with the arrival of the last migrants the four uh, um, you know and uh, which is around 1500 bce by when all the migrations are in even though my epilogue in the current book looks at a little bit into the periods after that but it doesn't so this book would be a continuation of the last one uh, when major things were happening in indian society and culture great great sir um, sir balakrishna sir yeah yeah for me uh, I, i think um, first of all it's been a great thing i have i read um, um, tony is uh, repeating very importantly i also keep telling that history we cannot escape actually it's not only important and useful it is inescapable because that uh, uh, why i am uh, interested in history is not for any browdo because i am interested in present and i am interested in future so if you are interested in present and future you have to be interested about the past so because the past teaches lot of things it is not to talk about browdo actually it's not to glorify oneself uh, to learn the lessons also so then uh, we we often say that history repeats itself actually it is not a very cliche actually it is the fact that history is repeating i i narrate uh, more importantly i am doing a useful thing i felt during this pandemic imagine uh, you just put the pandemic and the uh, corona related thing covid related thing was unfolding in the world how the different parts of the world different people responded to it that will actually give a glimpse about the history how is to handle it what type of responses can take place uh, why people walked in the highways of india uh, why why uh, one individual was running away from another individual how a fear can treat so a lot of history has got a lot of things to teach and i i always consider uh, the ruthless people are the most ruthless that being Uh, the you see that sometimes normally we say that uh, village people are more hospitable okay you can't generally say that but reasonably because that the rootedness is always uh, less ruthlessness and at the same time mobility is always giving a greater amount of confidence also so that means the world is both made of uh, travel as well as staying back so it's a kind of a continuous process um, uh, i am a traveler and to, to know that i am a, uh, i i am a, i am a part of a tree that means it's something like a flower understanding or a branch understanding i am not aloof i am a part of a tree knowing that i am a part of tree itself is enlarges my vision so history is actually enlarging uh, the tolerance enlarging vision it teaches you how not to be how to be so that means i take history as a very useful thing uh, but at the same time my indulgence in history is not to glorify i i would never say that in sangam literature the milk was running and everywhere a golden guy and all was good and no the bad people were there good people were there so but there is a lessons to be learned so to guide us so that way it's a very useful process i i, I feel really fulfilled that i spent my uh, spare time in this kind of exercise uh, you were asking that we have uh, what i am currently doing currently my number one priority is uh, getting the tamil translation out uh, we are uh, every day in between i had a sangachurangam and this tamil nadu jala in vigadan it really diverted my time uh, 40 episodes uh, it was a, a very demanding one so just about last week only it was completed so now i am little free uh, away from office work i am concentrating in tamil translation which we feel that will be able to finish within next few months maybe uh, april or may types great great sir uh, thanks both of you for your uh, uh, great time uh, for us thank you note uh, patient uh, uh, palpani naya has been who has been the person who who formed this team I meaning who identified this is a right way to start our pongal program and also have our uh, antiquity and heritage brought out so few words from him sir it's a uh... getting quite late uh, in the united states probably not where you are uh, but anyway uh, this is a subject that's of uh, great interest for 
all of us, particularly the Tamil diaspora. And uh, we have been following your, uh, both of your uh, work, your publications, your presentations for almost uh, 10 years now. And we are really uh, uh, privileged to have you both talk to us in this particular uh, topic. Uh, what I would suggest is that in future, we would like to keep in touch with uh, people like you so that we can understand uh, what is happening in this particular area that, uh, uh, as we say, where we come from, what has been our origin. And this is uh, something that's culturally very important for us. So uh, we will uh, request that uh, please do keep in touch with us. Uh, most of us travel to India quite often. Uh, I don't know, uh, Mr. Balakrishnan and uh, Mr. Joseph, are you are you in India or now have you? You are also part of our diaspora. <laughs> he is in Australia now. <laughs> You know, the question is, uh, is Sir move permanently or he is going to be back, back in India? Uh, I do not. I, 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 currently, I am not. But uh, I will be uh, in India in a few months. Okay. Oh, good, good, good. good. But uh, the idea is that we should all uh, keep in touch and make sure that we exchange ideas. And we are eagerly waiting for all the kind of research you are doing particularly the genetic research. I think that's very important. That's the latest, I believe, the technology in the archae archaeological field. The genetic archaeology is uh, the one that's opening a lot of uh, information to all of us. So anyway, thank you for taking the time. Uh, you have spent almost uh, two and a half hours with us. Very, very, we are very much indebted, indebted to you for uh, for your efforts and for your uh, time to, that is spent with us quite constructively. So thank you, and uh, we will uh, hopefully meet you again pretty soon. Thank you. Thank you. Very thank, much. You. Thank, thank you, Tony. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you.